Uh, welcome, everyone. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you here um, uh, today at the Nancy Friend Pritzker Building. Um, uh, welcome to the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Um, I want to thank all of you uh, who are able to uh, be here in person, as well as the many um, folks who are joining us virtually, including our uh, distinguished keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Nora Volkoff, who's the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Um, as you all know, uh, today we are here. Um, in fact, uh, today we are here on Jim's birthday uh, to honor um, uh, Dr. James Sorensen and to celebrate his life and his remarkable career at UCSF, which spanned 45 years. I'd like to start by recognizing uh, Laurel Kaepernick, Jim's wife, um, who uh, we're so delighted is able to be here in person today, as well as family members from Chicago and from New York across the United States who are joining us by Zoom. We're so glad that you could be here, that all of you can be here today um, uh, to, um, uh, to hear firsthand how much Jim meant to the department, to UCSF, and to the entire field. It's hard to convey how impactful his work has been in advancing our understanding of and treatment of addiction and in fostering generation after generation of leaders in our field. Um, as a testament to his impact, most of the speakers you'll hear from today were either trained by Jim or close collaborators. In fact, um, I, I think it would have been hard to impossible for us to put together a state-of-the-art symposium in this area of work that didn't share those characteristics. Um, just some of his many outstanding accomplishments, including, of course, um, being um, a longtime director of our ZSFG Division of Substance Abuse and Addiction Medicine, uh, co-leading our NIH Treatment Research Center, uh, being awarded a, a vast portfolio of NIDA-funded research projects, all designed to improve uh, substance use treatment. And, of course, a uh, huge figure nationally, a tireless peer reviewer for the NIH, uh, served on the NIDA Council and held multiple leadership positions within the College of Problems on Drug Dependence. Jim's death leaves an unfillable void in our department, uh, but his many contributions have made us a national leader in substance use research and in training and created a remarkable community here, uh, many of whom you will hear from today, that will continue to thrive and to lead in this area. Um, you're going to hear much more now from uh, those who knew and work closely with Jim, so uh, let me uh, quickly move to cover our program today. Uh, following our keynote speaker, you'll hear from folks focusing on Jim's research career, uh, including key contributions in the areas of opioid treatment, HIV, and health services, as well as his deep commitment to our training and clinical programs, including through uh, our longstanding 9 T32 Fellowship in Substance Use Research. The second part of the symposium uh, consists of brief presentations from several UCSF faculty highlighting our ongoing NIDA funded research at UCSF that is continuing to build on Jim's remarkable legacy. And in closing, we'll hear presentations about Jim's mentoring and leadership in the addiction field and plans to honor his memory within and outside of UCSF. Um, uh, and please, importantly, for those of you who are here in person, join us for a reception on our fourth floor terrace at the conclusion of um, uh, the remarks today. Um, now, it's my pleasure to vacate the podium for Dr. Carmen Masson, a distinguished member of our faculty who worked very closely with Jim, and she'll introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Dr. State, and welcome, everybody. It, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Nora Volkoff. Dr. Volkoff is the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the National Institutes of Health. NIDA is the world's largest funder of research on health aspects of drug use and addiction. Dr. Volkoff's work has been instrumental in demonstrating that drug addiction is a brain disorder. As a research psychiatrist, Dr. Volkoff pioneered the use of brain imaging to investigate how substance use affects brain functions. In particular, her studies have documented that changes in the dopamine system affect the functions of frontal brain regions involved with reward and self-control in addiction. She has also made important contributions to the neurobiology of obesity, ADHD, and aging. She will be speaking with us today about the state of the science of HIV AIDS and addiction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Volkoff. 
Hello, everyone. Good, good afternoon. I, it's a pleasure for me to introduce this day of celebration of uh, Jim's life. And as I think about it, it is uh, celebrating his work, his life, and, and recognizing at the same time um, what a loss we've had. I mean, so it is one of those instances where you honor the event and the opportunity, but there is always this lagging sadness of knowing that he's not with us because it's not just that he was an extraordinary scientist uh, he was in, an incredible and loyal friend and collaborator and as has been said before mentor so what i'm going to be uh, presenting today is actually work that has been inspired by his leadership and that has completely transformed the way in which we address the problem of hiv but also it has had repercussions in the way that we had, uh, the, uh, address uh, the treatment and prevention of substance use disorders. With that, I want to start with my slides and let me, here it is. Are they observable? No. Oh, yes? yes? Okay, great. Um, I mean, it is, and it has been said before, I mean, Dr. Sorensen had a profound impact on the field of addiction and made major contributions to our understanding of treatment for individuals with HIV AIDS and substance use disorders. Uh, his more recent work has focused on linking research and practice in the addictions and studying ethical issues faced by staff when providing treatment for substance use disorders. Um, something that unfortunately has been neglected and that he, he, has been, he had brought to light and made us aware that we need to tackle it. He has also mentored many trainees over the past four and a half decades. And he, his work has been crucial in helping us remove barriers faced by ethnic minorities and women in clinical and health services research, and to encourage the development of researchers from underrepresented populations. Something also that way too late, we have come to realize that it's crucial for us to advance the field. What uh, many of you may be aware what his uh, career was like, but I do just want to take a minute to go over it. In 75, he got his PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Rochester. From, uh, from there, he went to be an assistant professor at Bowling Green University. And in 78, he became a postdoctoral fellowship at UCSF. He built his career at UCSF. He was the Chief of Substance Abuse Services at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center. And um, he has, uh, as was said, more than 40 years career uh, at UCSF. And in the process, he has published over 250 articles, chapters, and books, and has helped uh, NIH enormously in review process, as well as in leading some of the most important clinical work at the CTN. He directed the NIDA-funded San Francisco Treatment Research Unit uh, between 89 and 1994, and several other NIH and non-governmentally supported research and training programs, including the Arizona Node and Western State Node of the National Drug Abuse Treatment Clinical Trial Network. He a member of the Institute of Medicine Committee on Community-Based Drug Treatment, which produced a report that led to developments of the Clinical Trial Network. And he made a linking of research and practice his major area of focus. And for that, we are incredibly grateful. Um, his, his, his work really was in that very difficult and complex area that lies at the intersection of HIV and substance use. We've known all along from the beginning that HIV has been in twin with substance use and the contribution of substance use to HIV the, uh, has shifted so during the whole pandemic period of the HIV crisis. As of now, in the United States, more than 30,000 people acquire HIV every year. And that is one component. Meanwhile, in parallel, we have the uh, overdose crisis that takes the life of more than 107,000 people in 2021, 108,000 in 2022. And, um, it does, and this is a crisis that it does not seem to, we seem to be able to control. Moreover, the overdose mortality we know is higher in individuals that uh, actually have a substance use disorder and also are HIV positive. So they are particularly more vulnerable. Because substance use plays such a significant role in HIV transmission and in the health outcomes of people living with HIV, 
And NIDA is one of the largest funders of HRE research at the NIH. In fact, is the second largest funder followed just by, I mean, by NIA, which is the main, main funder. But our work is very unique and different from what NIA does, and it's crucial. And this can be the importance of the HIV into our, more, uh, into our mission as an institute actually is reflected in our strategic plan. So NIDA strategic line, of course, emphasizing the importance of basic fundamental research because it gives us the, the baseline with which you can then develop prevention, uh, treatments and prevention, and also the ba basis for which to actually um, promote policies that make sense that are going to be helping people, whether they have drugs uh, uh, by themselves or have comorbid conditions, uh, including HIV. And this in turn facilitates um, the development of, of new models of care that can make these uh, interventions much more accessible and hopefully more equitable among those that need them. So where are we with HIV and why is the research that uh, Jim did and we continue to do at the HIV that he had at, at NIDA that he had so much inspired? Well, uh, we had for many years, actually for close to two decades, the incidence of HIV in our country could not be uh, reduced. It was close around 40, 50,000. And then starting in 2016, more than 2015, we started to see a slow progressive decrease in the incidence, which is of course great news. And there was this data from CDC reporting that there was uh, the infections in uh, HIV in the United States have decreased by 8% between 2015 and 2019. However, if we continue to log, or look beyond that, we also observe that this seems to have been accelerated. And I just got the latest numbers I could get from CDC. And in 2021, an estimated 32,100 people had new HIV infections, which is significantly lower than the 34,800 that there were in 2019. And if you look at that, uh, from that perspective, we have seen the acceleration on the decrease in the incidence of HIV. So for this period, uh, since 2017 to 2021, we have seen a 12% reduction. If we look at it and try to understand, well, what happened that led from that plateauing into a decrease in the incidence, there are some major advances that have been made. I mean, certainly we knew that uh, what prevention, behavioral prevention interventions could be done to decrease the risk of HIV work. Uh, and, and the more you implement it, the greater the reductions in risk for HIV. But a transformative insight came about around 2015, even though the data may have emerged in 2013, showing that people that were on antiretroviral therapy were no longer infectious. And also, therefore, very also, not only they were not longer infectious, but uh, they overall, regardless of what their CD4 counts were and at the stage of the disease that they were, if you would place them on antiretroviral therapies right away, their outcomes would be much more, uh, much better. So you add these two very important findings that initiating antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible will improve the outcome of someone that is infected, but also it will basically abolish his infectivity that made it possible, not only much better prognosis for people overall, but importantly, to start to see these reductions in the incidence of HIV. More recently, PrEP has been actually added as another prevention intervention that is contributing to the decreases in the incidence. The extent to which actually it has the same effect is limited by the level of penetration. So, PrEP is not widely distributed as it should be. And unfortunately, even though the data is so very strong to indicate that we should initiate antiretroviral therapy as soon as you get a positive diagnosis, this is not necessarily widely implemented. And those are problems that of course are slowing down our goal to decrease by 2030, the incidence of HIV cases to 3000 
which unless we change and you and sort of activate and modify this uh, this cultural um, reluctance or, res or or reluctance sometimes or lack of resources, we will not be able to achieve. An important component in actually also achieving this uh, 3000 goal for 2013 is that we need to pay much more attention to people that are, are taking drugs as uh, in, uh, in terms of interventions to treat them so that we can contain the infectivity of these individuals, but also improve their outcomes. Unfortunately, if you look at it traditionally on the way that it is described, these are the contributions percentage wise of different groups to the new cases of uh, HIV. The majority of them, 70%, account by, uh, it's basically behaviors among gay, bisexual, and other men who report male-to-male -male sexual contact. That's 70%. 22 relate to heterosexual contacts. And then there's only an identification now of 7% of people contributing who are injecting drugs to the new cases of HIV. This number used to be 30%, but um, interventions and pu um, public health interventions have actually been able to bring down the infectivity of these individuals. Some very simple interventions like harm reduction, providing safe uh, syringes for people to inject uh, has been one of the factors that has contributed to the significant reduction of the new, of the contribution of injection drug users into new cases of HIV. But what is clear is that it's absent, and I think that until we start to pay more attention to it, we're going to be lagging behind, is the contribution of drugs, not just by injection itself, but by the changes in behavior that they produce that actually are contributing to the new infections. And this is very notable if you look at it in specifically, most notable, I think, uh, are stimulant drugs, as well as alcohol, uh, even though alcohol may have not got the same level of attention, but methamphetamine does. And we have known that uh, for many years that um, men who have sex with men, many times using methamphetamine when they're going to be engaging in very risky behaviors because, because it facilitates the disinhibition that is necessary for them to be able to uh, go to some of the, on the places where they are going to be encountering other men. And also stimulant drugs enhance sexual desire. And as a result of that, they actually have a prominent role in the contribution of infection. Because when someone is intoxicated with methamphetamine, behaviors that they would otherwise avoid actually not, do not pertain. Their ability to exert self-regulation and um, basically produce uh, good decisions is significantly impaired. And that leads to very impulsive actions and so not surprising contributions to new infections of HIV. So this is a paper that was published in 2020 that followed 4,786 sexual and gender minority men who have sex with men. For, they followed them for 12 months and they found that 14% of those that reported persistent methamphetamine use were newly HIV infected. So within one year, 14% of them became HIV infected. And you can see that that's a very high rate of infection. And if you look at the whole cohort of 4,786 participants, one third of them that zero converted to uh, HIV were persistent methamphetamine users. And I think that this, this data eloquently states how important is this other component of drugs that is not in the radar of organizations or prevention interventions. And yet we need to focus it because otherwise we are going to continue to decrease, which is wonderful, that contribution from injection drug use, but we now have more and more utilization of drugs by other means. And injection drug use overall uh, is decreasing at the use of uh, smoking and other ways of administering drugs. And this brings me to the, um, a slide that Tony Fauci uh, like to present in terms of how, whether, where, even though we don't have cures for HIV, we do have very strong evidence-based prevention interventions 
that if they were implemented sufficiently, they would actually um, very much control the HIV. In principle, theoretically, we should be able to get rid of HIV if they were implemented. Obviously, they are not implemented, and this, for it to be effective, it has to be applied globally. Uh, very crucial, as I mentioned, is treatment as prevention, and that relates to the initiation with antiretroviral therapy as a means to decrease the infectivity of individuals. It was very reinforcing to my brain when I saw the slide modified to include treatment and prevention of drug and alcohol abuse. And this is actually reflects what I was just saying. It's not just about injection drug use, but the recognition that this is a target area for prevention. Unfortunately, actually how much that is translated into actions is not necessarily evident. And this is actually a release from the US Preventive Service Task Force on the prevention of acquisition of HIV pre-exposure pre priorities, which is very important because it actually determines whether these, uh, based on these recommendations, whether that intervention are going to be reimbursed or not. And so they basically they are, what they are recommending is, yes, PrEP should be reimbursed and given to persons that are at increased risk for HIV acquisition. And what you see there is uh, individuals that are sexually active, adults and adolescents, uh, who have been uh, basically engaged in anal or vaginal sex in past six months and have any of the following. Sexual partner who has HIV, sexually transmitted infection in past six months, inconsistent or no condom use, particularly with high-risk partners. And then they do address that persons who inject drugs are also a group that should be targeted for PrEP. But there's no speaking about individuals that may be misusing other drugs, who, as I mentioned, are also at very high risk. So these are some of the details that can make the implementation much more restricted. And it is particularly uh, consequential because you say, OK, well, this is just the uh, recommendations from the US Preventive Services. But that's very basis uh, for whether we do reimburse or not, which is crucial. But the other issue why it is so important is that addiction is stigmatized and people that are addicted are stigmatized and they are stigmatized even more if they have HIV. And so as a result of that, what we're faced with is not just that the providers are less likely to give them a PrEP, particularly if they are not injecting drug use because they are not going to be reimbursed, but because they are don't like these patients. And and this is also very uh, negative because these negative attitudes towards people that take drugs actually not just interfere with their willingness to be given PrEP, which again has relatively low penetration, but even more importantly, the likelihood that they may be initiated on antiretroviral therapy if they are HIV positive. And that's incredibly consequential. And so this, for example, presents two, um, two surveys, uh, one done in the United States to the left uh, and the other one done in Malaysia, uh, in which they actually reach out to providers to find out, those were um, primary care providers, how they felt about people in this case who were injecting drugs to see if there was a bias for their willingness of initiating them or treating them. And um, in the United States, 32% of them reported explicit bias to towards people who inject drugs. 88% um, had an implicit bias. Alone, only 9% of all of these primary care providers had no implicit or explicit bias. And the higher the levels that the providers reported for explicit or implicit bias, uh, the lower the likelihood that they would be prescribing PrEP. And I, I present this statement because it's actually one that, again, why I said we need to focus on this stigmatization, discrimination, neglect of individuals that take drugs, whether it is injecting drugs or whether it is um, taking them by other means. And similar, people, similar findings are actually um, reported in this study, but it was whether they would delay uh, antiretroviral therapy in people who inject drugs uh, with advanced HIV. So this is not even early on. And you can see that people who inject drugs uh, are 45% of the providers are much more likely to delay uh, the initiation 
And in, and in the process, they are going to make their outcomes worse and they're going to increase the likelihood that these individuals infect others. The other aspect that why it becomes so very important to target this uh, stigma and discrimination is that while we have uh, to tackle the HIV epidemic, on the other hand, we also are living the overdose crisis. Um, and the most powerful tools that we have in the overdose crisis is the medications for opioid use disorder, whether it is methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone. All of these medications have been shown to decrease opioid use, to reduce significantly the risk for opioid overdoses up to 70%, to reduce criminal activity, to reduce HIV and HCV transmission. And that was demonstrated decades ago. You treat someone with a medication for opioid use disorder, you decrease the risk of getting infected with HIV. And now where we have a very active HCV epidemic of HCV2, not surprising. And it also, these medications increase social functioning, improve uh, the outcomes for people that are being treated in, uh, for their HIV. It keeps them retaining treatment and it improves their outcomes and parameters. And so uh, then why are we not doing it? And I think that this is an aspect that relates to the fact that sometimes actually you may have the science, but you do not actually necessarily implement it. And that, uh, to your right, you see an, an analysis that shows the impact of medications for opioid use disorders on HIV transmission. It's not that we need to do any more work. You can clearly show that medication for opioid use disorder, those are different uh, trials done in North America, Europe, or Southeast Asia. Uh, medications reduce HIV infections by 54%. So it's a very large effect. And at the same time, as I say, medication for opioid use disorders reduces overdose risk by 73%. So the question is, it's a low hanging fruit. Why are we not doing it? And, and, I, and, I, and I think that there are multiple factors in trying to understand why when you have data that shows that it's going to significantly improve outcomes in general, but, and that includes people that are very, very vulnerable, how stigma and discrimination actually put that group at greater risk. Um, this is the latest data that we have uh, related to the overdose deaths uh, in, that we are living in the United States. You see that the majority is from synthetic opioids and fentanyl. But if you look at uh, purple and, and black, I think that's or, or dark blue, it is stimulant drugs. And those numbers have been increasing. And what we right now see in terms of the op overdose crisis is polysubstance use. People are dying with multiple drugs in the body. And, um, and the illicit drug market that they get their hands on is frequently contaminated. So this is much more um, the common pattern than it is the exception. And we know in this respect that people that um, have, um, who have, uh, who live with AIDS uh, are, have a much higher risk of taking opioids. And this is shown here, whether it is medical or non-medical, here you have people living with HIV, um, people that are HIV negative and those that are unknown. And you can see the significant differences in terms of uh, the, the use of opioids. And, and those, it is one of the factors that likely contributes to why they are at higher risk of overdosing. Now, how bad is the gap in implementation? And, and it is very serious. And I'm just going to actually just focus at this time in terms of the gap in implementation for medications for opioid use disorders, uh, which we see in the, in, in the side, in the graph on the left, a drug overdose deaths 2019 to 2020, where you can see treatment for substance use misuse. That was treatment for opioid use disorders uh, on people that have overdosed. And only 16% of them um, all across average, actually. 16% was the highest, sorry. That's the whites and uh, received the medications. But you can see very significant differences with other ethnic groups. But regardless, the numbers are very, very low. And it is very likely that if these people had been given medications for opioid use disorder and kept on them, they would have not died. So one of the, the priorities for us at the Institute and the Clinical Trials Network, including Jim Sorensen, 
play a very important job in is how do we implement new models of care that can help us expand providing treatment for opioid use disorder in general, and certainly maximize the likelihood that people that are at high risk for HIV or are HIV positive are given access to these medications. And so through the clinical trial network, this has enabled us to permeate the healthcare systems, creating new models that actually rely on primary care physicians, that rely also on, on, on integration of care between infectious disease physicians and, in the, and physicians that are uh, treating the substance use disorder, as well as on emergency department. And I would say, again, I want to reiterate how crucial the contributions of Dr. Sorenson were for the clinical trial network. But there's another program that also is very consequential for the HIV, and that is the Justice Community Opioid Innovation Network, or JCON. And this is a program that basically creates a network of researchers that are engaged in justice settings to develop evidence-based practices that can help improve the outcomes on people that are in jails or are on parole and can improve their outcomes once they are released into the community. For the case of individuals with um, and, and its relationship with HIV, it is fundamental. To start with, we know that uh, the unfortunately, and as has happened for many of the diseases, there is tremendous health disparities, and underrepresented groups are, uh, are uh, have the greatest burden of these diseases. For uh, HIV, the incidence has always been significantly, significant high, higher among Black Americans. And so as of now, this is data from 2021 by the CDC, and it shows that 40% of the new cases are actually in Black Americans, and 29% Hispano Latino. Considering that these are minority groups, and yet they have the majority of cases, that gets you an idea of that disproportionate burden. Um, the sexual, the risky sexual behaviors that may be contributing to some of the increases in, in risk in HIV are actually more, more, more present uh, in younger individuals than in older ones. And in younger individuals also, this is the group that actually is at greater risk uh, for experimenting with drugs, for taking drugs, and unfortunately for getting into behaviors that may end up in the justice setting. And again, here we have a horrific disparity. I mean, a structural process that in our country has led to the over-incarceration of Black Americans, particularly young ones, and, um, and, and actually has, has contributed to, to the mortality, morbidity in so many negative ways. And, and you can see it here, the US population to the left, and in the same graph to the right, incarcerated population. And just like we were saying that 40% of the new cases are in Black Americans, we can see that 38% of people that are incarcerated are Black Americans, even though they're only 13% of the population. And you take this, and you take this, and you come to realize that actually for that intersection of a drug use and HIV, this becomes an important target for us. So one of our, of our priorities over the past five years has been to build, and as I say, a network that will provide the tools that will train the investigators that generate the partnership with academic centers and healthcare systems to actually uh, develop an active research program that can help implement evidence-based interventions to actually provide for proper treatment in individuals that may have uh, opioid use disorder or at very high risk, so they can be initiated into treatment, actually whether they are, they are while they are in the jail, just before they leave the jail, and to ensure continuity of care. And this program actually has been quite successful, even though it only has five years of life, and it has changed, uh, helped us change the culture. So there has been a significant increase in the uptake of a provision of medications for opioid use disorders in jails, as well as prisons in the United States. And this is something that has been facilitated in part, not just by the generation of evidence that results, that shows that it results in much better outcomes, but also by showing that actually it decreases reincarceration. 
And that too, I mean, I was also say from the practical perspective during the COVID pandemic where we had expansion of telemedicine that also made it much easier to start to implement these treatments in jails or prisons that in the past they couldn't do it because they did not have the medical personnel to do so. So where are we and where do we go from now? And I sort of says, what are the major barriers and gaps? Absolutely, we've done enormous advances actually in the whole HIV field and in the intersection of HIV and substance use disorders. But we, it's clear that there are major gaps that are remaining. And these gaps need, these, these gaps need to be addressed because otherwise we are not going to be achieving that goal of 3,000, of decreasing the incidence of HIV by 2030 to 3,000. So the number one, I would say, is stigma. And this stigma actually, as I started my presentation, relates both to individuals that take drugs and it's exacerbated by people that actually are HIV positive. And then this can be further exacerbated for underrepresented groups. And as a result of this stigma, first of all, these people are not given proper access they are actually pushed out and in making their behaviors a higher risk because they find themselves actually withdrawn from any from social support and discriminated. And so if we don't address the stigma, uh, we, we are going to, we can develop all of the evidence-based interventions showing that they work. Uh, if they don't get implemented, if we don't address stigma, they will not be properly implemented. There are many things also that need to be addressed in the healthcare system. We need to close the treatment gap. And this is in order to be able to achieve continuity of care. And I think in the HIV field, this has advanced much more than in that of the substance use disorder. Despite this, both of these fields need strengthening to facilitate the continuity of care. One of the aspects that the work that science has shown that is beneficial is the integration of HIV and substance use disorder care. And these models, for example, have shown to be uh, quite effective and beneficial in many countries across the globe, where the HIV treatments are dispensed alongside a methadone clinic. There's also a need for training providers, both on HIV and substance use, and to actually overcome, to help them overcome some of their unwillingness to treat people with substance use disorders because of lack of confidence on their skills. A very important uh, gap that uh, an obstacle is inadequate reimbursement. There's been lots of work trying to make um, the medications for opioid use disorder more accessible, and in particular for buprenorphine, which is the one that's most widely utilized. So they've removed the waiver, and yet we don't see that that having a lar as large as an effect as it was expected. And one of the issues is that clinicians that can provide treatment for buprenorphine don't do so because the reimbursement they get is not sufficient to cover their costs. So this has to be tackled. And also, we need to continue to improve uh, the treatment of individuals in justice settings, and, and this is is crucial if we want them to uh, actually prevent them from overdosing when they leave uh, those justice settings, but also importantly, to help them actually recover. And, um, and, and, in the, and in, also in, in the process, providing better outcomes for their children and their families. And two, I think that sometimes we all work very much towards treatment. But there's another area that we tend to neglect uh, in general, and that is prevention. And I did start with Tony Fauci's uh, bag of prevention tools that we have for HIV, but we also have to put them in terms of prevention tools that we have for helping people um, avoid engaging in risky behaviors such as substance use disorder. And yet we don't lack as a country the infrastructure to provide these evidence-based prevention interventions that have been shown by many investigators using different models to be beneficial. And importantly, across all of these things, we need to address the social determinants of health because they are crucial in determining in contributing to drug use, addiction, and HIV. And they're also crucial in their poor treatment engagement and retention. And if we don't tackle them, we again, we continue to basically exacerbate the problems of the stigma 
but also make certain segments of our population and our community much more vulnerable. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Volkov. Uh, now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Stephen Botke, professor in the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Thank you so much, Dr. Masson. Carmen, thanks. Um, Dr. State, thank you so much for um, presenting here. And Dr. Volkov, what an honor to have you. Um, as I was listening to Dr. Volkov, I was thinking of all the points she touched on that Jim Sorensen touched on during his career, and in fact, really brought to the attention of the field, one of, one of the pioneers um, of that. So um, I'd like to spend at the uh, few minutes we have just giving a quick and somewhat of a personalized uh, summary. This is a keyhole from which I view Jim. I am uh, was talking to folks here, and I think I'm one of the both oldest and longest uh, colleagues of, uh, of Jim, but there are plenty of us here. And, and simply being here for me is an integrative experience that helps me uh, view our careers, my career, Jim's career, um, overlapping and reinforcing um, many ripples that we all send among each other with Jim being a super focal point. Um, and Carmen, I'm not sure if I should make this a bit shorter, but I'll let uh, Owen tell me when my time is up. So um, just in terms of a brief overview, um, these are the things I'm gonna touch on, but really most important, and I know that Dennis and his uh, talk also refers to this. I think we all are aware the, the human aspects of Jim that, whoa, transcend uh, the work the teaching, the training, the research, the clinical work, the leadership, the service, the personal aspects of Jim and really Jim and Laurel, uh, Laurel Kaepernick, his wife, uh, because she uh, is integral to Jim's work and she's integral to the involvement of most of us here who work with Jim. Um, I was telling Laurel the other day that I still have the NIH, the DHHS black felt tip pen from I think 1984 or five when I was putting in my first component grant as part of um, one of Jim's uh, or perhaps Reese Jones's center grants. And Jim and Laurel gave me a little note with that pen, which I still have that said, you know, may you have, this was when things were wet signed, which of course many of our younger generation of folks aren't familiar with, but you actually had to sign paper back then. Um, and talking about generations, uh, Ricardo Munoz and I were talking about the, the several generations of um, Jim's, um, again, his influence and how that reverberates. So uh, this has already been touched on, I think, by Nora. It's also in your handout. There's a much better summary. I want to give a nod to uh, the late Bill Hargraves, who is a fantastic uh, UCSF researcher now. Uh, Bill wasn't strictly a, a substance use disorder researcher, but he was a health services. He was a measurement guy who really sought to get answers to major questions about what makes for treatment effectiveness. And Jim, I think, uh, benefited from his tutelage. And then we've all benefited from Bill's tutelage. But Jim magnifies this and not only magnified, but Jim also focused on addiction. Um, and brought that treatment research work to bear on an area which, quite frankly, has not always been a popular part of mental health nor medicine. So, you know, there's some analogies here. Psychiatry and psychology, the behavioral sciences, have not always been perceived by the rest of healthcare as the most important, the most prestigious, the most valued. And then within the microcosm of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, psychology and related fields within our field, addiction itself is, again, not really the most favored and certainly not 40 years ago. So Jim was brave. Jim was brave taking that vaunted treatment research that Bill Hargraves taught him and bearing that lens on the focus of 
use disorders, which were, of course, called drug abuse. And people who had this were drug abusers, not human beings with substance use disorders, as we, you know, we shape our language every day, every week, every year, we get better at communicating in some more accurate way, the humanity that underlies all medical disorders, and certainly um, mental health, psychologists and psychiatrists, social workers, and all the rest of us, you know, work in the most personal, intimate, vulnerable, sometimes stigmatized and shamed and shameful domains in healthcare. Addiction kind of is the, you know, the ultra focus of that stigma of mental health. And so, you know, back in 1983, Langley Porter was not the, you know, people weren't recommending, hey, go into addiction. I remember my mother was upset that I was going to psychiatry and medicine, but when she learned that I was going to be in addiction, wow. And then when Jim brought the focus to HIV, and, and this cannot be overestimated, that Jim was among the first pioneers and UCSF and ZSFG, which was San Francisco General Hospital at the time, and many of you um, who've worked in this thread of work that has continued from um, 1983, I think it was 1984 that uh, I was doing um, detox physicals because uh, out of residency in 83, my first job was with Jim, uh, my first mentor, my first boss. Uh, actually, Ricardo Munoz was bridging. Uh, Jim Dilly and I were Ricardo's mentees. Um, I took the uh, Ward 93 methadone clinic, which was what it was called at the time, job. And it was not the kind of job that most people thought was something you should be proud of because um, substance use disorders are uh, stigmatized, but not only the use disorder itself and not even the patients, but the people who work with them in the settings in which we work and the research that's done. And it, it's not been an easy thing, but it's gotten tremendously more recognized. And I want to acknowledge Dr. State and the Department of Psychiatry, the leadership, the training programs. You know, we're recognized as one of the absolute leaders in addiction training, research and clinical uh, in the country. Of course, psychiatry in general has um, one of the absolute best um, research programs and training programs in general psychiatry, general psychology, but the addiction training and research is really recognized as well. Um, so Jim had a lot of guts going into something that certainly was not valued. And in fact, the place where we worked wasn't terribly valued either. Um, it was back then, it wasn't hard to get space because nobody wanted to be in building 80 and 90. And so that's where they put HIV and addiction um, and eventually got more popular and we lost some of the space. Uh, there's more competition. You know, when you bring the people, the patients, the funding that comes with it. And also, of course, we've evolved over these last 40 years and there's pretty universal accept acceptance in the health field about the importance of the work because it's not just seen as psychiatry and psychology. It's not just seen as behavioral science. It's not just seen as addiction. It really is seen as stuff that affects every other darn thing that has to do with health. And addiction is right there among the most potent of the influences that affect health. And Jim got this. Jim never just focused on addiction. Jim taught me the importance of co-occurring disorders and how nothing is really boundary, but everything is fluid and interrelated. And so this was a place, uh, a beautiful place, actually. You know, um, it, it was funky. You couldn't close the window and um, rain came in. Um, and uh, every year I had to go to the uh, board, you know, to the commissioners, the health commission and ask for money for the next year. So we keep getting funded. Back then there was methadone, there was 21 day detox, which is a crazy modality because nobody overcomes opioid use disorder in 21 days. And there was quote maintenance. Um, and uh, I want to thank um, Andy, uh, Andy Tompkins, who's here because he's carrying on this work uh, in a super way. And Andy, um, had, Andy's in these buildings, Andy's doing this work now, uh, the work that Jim really brought to me and to us and to Andy, um, and it continues, and the work is foundational, 
And the value for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences is immense because we're positioned as a real leader um, in training, clinical work, and research at the VA, at San Francisco General's DSFG, at Langley Porter, now extending into the general medical clinics. There's great stuff going on, but this really started with Jim. And Jim is still here. And Jim, I don't know if you can see him, he's the guy in the lower right in the black and white picture. He's the guy um, on the uh, left in the upper picture. I'm also in both of these. Um, uh, Jim kept his hair. Uh, I, I didn't. But Jim's foundational work, and this reflects on everything that Nora was talking about. It really started with Jim and a very few other people. Um, you know, we, it was, this was before HIV. We, what we saw was people getting sick. Um, I remember doing physicals and looking at people's throats and seeing white patches, uh, candida, yeast infection. Um, another wonderful thing about substance use disorders, by the way, as a physician, is how medical it is. And for those of us who like medical psychiatry and behavioral sciences, it's a super, it's the best thing there is because not only are you in um, psychology and psychiatry, but you're also in medicine. And we brought medical care into uh, the clinic, both on a research level, training level, but also as clinicians. We had a little HIV clinic because Initially, there was nothing uh, in terms of treatment as a uh, testament, see the signs, patient so-and-so died, the AIDS quote, that's Patricia Perez Arce in the uh, middle. This is probably 19, uh, maybe late 80s when all we had was Zidovudine, AZT, which really was terrible as, um, in terms of efficacy. Um, but nonetheless, um, Jim recognized as Dr. Volkoff pointed out that there is tremendous leverage you know, provided by the contact, the intensity and frequency of contact and substance users, which ironically is driven by a horribly antiquated system of regulations, which makes people who are taking methadone through an, quote, narcotic treatment program, you know, language from the 1930s. But that regulatory stuff made folks back then come in, which meant that they were accessible to HIV treatment, assessment, observed treatment. And Jim took advantage of that. Um, he leveraged what he knew about behavioral psychology, contingency management, behavioral interventions to magnify the very poor outcomes that were available from the terribly ineffective medical regimens we had. And Jim and I extended that work to H to TB, uh, TB chemoprophylaxis, ultimately to Hep C, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but Jim was really the seminal force in all this, um, foundational. There's a, um, a little card there that said that we, that was handed out in the tenderloin saying, hey, come, you can get a free detox because that was the entry point into treatment. Um, and we did HIV testing. Um, and that little, um, I think that's from one of mine or Jim's presentation showing, this is very early on, um, 131 visits on a Friday AIDS consultation clinic. We got Eric Goosby from Ward 86 to come into Ward 93, ran an HIV clinic there. And most of the patients were coming by drop-ins because folks had trouble keeping appointments when substance use intervenes and creates chaos in one's life. But we took advantage of this and Jim came up with the idea of monitoring treatment and reinforcing it. This was early on in the days of using behavioral contingents, which we know is one of the most important treatments. Um, I, you know, so many of us here, uh, Philip Coffin, uh, Todd Court, who's many others here, and I working in, for example, stimulant treatment disorders still know that contingencies are about the best way to do anything when we have ineffective treatments otherwise. But what you can see is one of the nurses working with a patient, um, handing out uh, Zidovudine, on site in the clinic. And Jim also did psychological or psychoeducational work um, using the health beliefs model. Um, this is one of Jim's slides, I think, from probably uh, 35 years ago or whatever, um, as indicating how you know, the, the theory base for psychoeducational work. Right next to it, you can see how primitive our um, efforts were. The, before there was even syringe exchange 
we were distributing bleach and Jim was a leader in doing whatever the hell we could, no matter how you know, poor it was and ineffective, it was something. And that Jim stayed right on top and at the edge of the field from then to now. So there's not much time and I'm not gonna um, belabor the many research activities, the um, many funded research projects, the huge uh, center grants he had, um, Jim was an immense collaborator. Um, this is a list of some of the folks there. Um, Jim's research was, uh, in his own words, um, substance use is a tough problem. You gotta do everything you can. Um, it's important. He was a pharmacotherapy leader early on in addition to being psychoeducational, psychosocial, using behavioral techniques. Much of our work right now is in looking for extended treatments. Jim's work with long acting methadone. So I'm gonna conclude by saying that not only was Jim creative, but he was generative. Um, and he had an immense number of trainees and these, um, and by the way, this presentation is available to you so that I don't feel pressured in reading all the words, but there are so many branches from the tree um, and I'm so proud um, and uh, all credit to Laurel Kaepernick in um, getting CPDD to stand with us and honoring Jim. Um, Jim, happy birthday. Thank you. Dr. Carmen Masson. Thank you, Dr. Botke. And thank you, everyone. So Dr. Sorensen uh, was my mentor, colleague, and good friend. I was fortunate to work with him over the years, and I'm honored to give this presentation in his memory. This was the last study that we collaborated on, and that's why I'm presenting it today. The title of this presentation is Predictors of Preferences for Buprenorphine Treatment Formulations. As we heard earlier, earlier by Dr. Volkoff, the opioid epidemic is a significant public health crisis that has caused extensive harm and devastation in the United States. As this slide shows, we've seen a steady increase in opioid-related overdose deaths since 2017. As this, uh, we saw that um, in 2013, and 20, from 2013 to 2016, uh, overdose death rates were fairly stable and then started to increase significantly and primarily due to fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Although there is a, an a, approved medication for the treatment of opioid use uh, disorder, um, buprenorphine, uh, it is very effective, but the problem is, as Dr. Volkoff mentioned, most people who need it uh, uh, do not receive it. There are multiple factors or barriers that are connected with, at the patient, provider, and system levels that contribute to buprenorphine underutilization. For example, stigma related to using or prescribing opioid use disorder medications, treatment experiences and beliefs, both positive and negative, logistical issues, knowledge of opioid use disorder, uh, and the role of medications. So we know that drug overdose is a leading and increasing cause of death among individuals experiencing homelessness. Thus, it, there is a need for more research to better identify barriers and facilitators for specific populations, such as people experiencing homelessness. So this study assessed preferences for buprenorphine treatment formulations among people experiencing homelessness with opioid use disorder. So our goal was to identify correlates of a preference for extended release buprenorphine over, over sublingual formulations. This is a cross-sectional survey. Um, we conducted the study between April of uh, 2022 and August of 2023. We surveyed homeless adults with opioid use disorders who were recruited from harm reduction programs in San Francisco. With respect to the demographic characteristic of the sample, we found that the sample was predominantly male, 55% white, 23% Hispanic or Latinx, and 10% African American. The majority had at least a high school education and were unemployed, and the average age of participants was 37 years. We examined substance use in the past 30 days, 
And we found high rates of fentanyl in stimulant use. Approximately 96% had used any stimulant, 93% fentanyl, 89% methamphetamine, and there was a lower percentage who had used cocaine. We also found the combined use of fentanyl and other substances was also highly prevalent. 89% used fentanyl and any stimulant, 83% used fentanyl and methamphetamine. With regard to the willingness to take buprenorphine in the future and the, the preferences for formulations, we found that 56, almost 57% uh, preferred the sublingual formulations. So we conducted a logistic regression analysis to identify these independent predictors of preferences for uh, either formulation. Um, as you can see in the slide, uh, our predictor variables were um, barriers and facilitators related to buprenorphine, including treatment experiences and beliefs about treatment. Our dichotomous, um, sur uh, dichotomous survey items were coded at, as uh, yes equals one, no equals zero. Survey items using a five-point Likert scale were scored um, with one very unlikely to five very likely. And the dependent variable examined preferences for, for formula, buprenorphine formulations. As you can see, extended release buprenorphine was coded as one. Sublingual formulations as zero or the reference group. Um, a preference... Um, uh, so we also examined the associations between uh, the demographic, clinical, and um, and preference for extended release bu uh, buprenorphine versus the sublingual formulations. And we did not find any uh, significant relationships between the demographic, clinical, health literacy variables, and the dependent variable. And so in our final step, what we did was to conduct a multiple variable logistic regression model with those factors that we did find that were independently associated with the outcomes. And so here are the results of that analysis. So in our logistic regression analysis, we found that agreeing with the statement of not being ready to start a long acting buprenorphine injection corresponded with the lower odds for preferences for extended release buprenorphine. Endorsing that, that one cannot change their mind if they take the injectable formulation corresponded with the lower odds of preferences for the extended release buprenorphine. Endorsing that it's more convenient to take a monthly injection than tablets or films every day corresponded with the greater odds for a, for a preference for extended release buprenorphine. And similarly endorsing that taking the injection means that I don't have to take buprenorphine film or pills every day corresponds with the greater odds for the preference for extended release buprenorphine. So these last two items are highly correlated and you see that the, the um, effect uh, for that second variable is att attenuated. So in conclusion, Buprenorphine is an acceptable treatment for people experiencing homelessness with opioid use disorder. Fentanyl use was highly prevalent. 93% had used fentanyl in the past 30 days. Fentanyl use in combination with any stimul stimulant was also highly prevalent. Our multiple logistic regression analysis found several independent predictors of preferences for extended release buprenorphine, including being ready to take long acting buprenorphine not really being concerned that they can't change their minds once they start treatment, and that extended bu uh, release buprenorphine is viewed as more convenient this, than sublingual buprenorphine. So we believe that the results from this study can inform discussions with people experiencing homelessness about the benefits and disadvantages of extended release buprenorphine, and also may inform uh, the design of strategies to increase uptake of extended release buprenorphine. So given my um, that we're running over, I just brief acknowledgements, our co-investigators, research staff, and community partners, and funding from NIDA. Thank you. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Caravella Makuchian. Uh, Dr. Makushchian is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UCSF. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to move this down. I'm a little shorter than everyone else. <laughs> 
Um, I wanted to start by saying I uh, came to UCSF because of Dr. Sorensen. I came from the University of Cincinnati and I was quite worried about coming across the country to do um, some more training in the clinical psychology training program. And I remember consulting with my mentor, Dr. Kathy Berlue in Cincinnati, and she said, oh, Jim Sorensen is there, you're gonna be all right. So um, he's part of the reason I'm here today. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of the projects that we worked on um, together. Many of you might know that Dr. Sorensen became really interested in ethical issues that are um, that counselors, SUD treatment counselors face um, at the end of his career. So I'm gonna be presenting some of the results from one of those studies. I wanna start out by talking a little bit about ethical issues that are present in SUD treatment. Um, they're very common. Um, counselors who work in these settings often face what we call ethical dilemmas, which are um, situations where they have to balance ethical principles while also offering person-centered services. So you could imagine something like um, trying to balance confidentiality laws while also prioritizing integrated care. Um, also balancing a client's autonomy versus they're involved in some sort of court order treatment. And um, these ethical dilemmas are important for us to know more about because um, they can challenge the patient counselor relationship. They can contribute to staff burnout or staff turnover, and they can really threaten the client engagement and retention. There are many ethical principles that SUD treatment counselors have to abide by. The National Association of Addiction Professionals, or NADAC, um, has created a code of ethical principles that guide the work that um, SUD counselors engage in. And there's nine principles outlined by NADAC. And within each of those nine principles, there is over 200 sub-principles. Um, so it's a very comprehensive code. But despite that comprehensiveness, training in ethics varies for SUD treatment counselors. So um, it varies by state, but training in some states can be something like two to six hours per year. Um, and it can go all the way up to 12 hour courses as a part of certification for SUD treatment training. Um, another issue is that there's a lack of research guiding the development of these ethical trainings. So that led Dr. Sorensen and our team to create some study aims. Um, the first thing that we wanted to know in this study is what ethical issues do SUD counselors face? The second thing we wanted to know is how do counselors resolve these issues? And then thirdly, what training would be helpful for SUD counselors related to ethical issues? Here's an overview of our study. We completed interviews with 20 SUD treatment counselors who were recruited from two clinics, one outpatient and one residential from February to August, 2020. Interviews were about 60 to 90 minutes. And the interviews included displaying different vignettes that um, included ethical issues based on those NADAC principles. And after the counselors were shown the vignettes, they were asked these three questions. Why do you think the, there are ethical issues in this situation? If possible, what would you do to solve the issue and why? And then how, has something like this ever happened in your workplace? And if so, how often and how was it handled? After they discussed the vignettes, they were also asked about any past ethics training that they have and any future ideas for future training. And um, as our study team collected this information, we used thematic analysis to code the transcribed interviews. So our results really um, were summarized in three key areas. I'm gonna start first by talking about ethical issues that um, were encountered. Um, there were a wide spectrum of issues. Client privacy was commonly reported and um, sometimes this was balanced in the face of mandated reporting by counselors. They also talked a lot about dual relationships. And then both of these quotes here reflect um, themes of fairness, which were also commonly reported. So I'm just gonna read these really quickly. Um, the first quote says, any counselor who's been on the job for more than two days knows that if you give a client something, every other client in the program is going to know within 12 hours. So this really reflects uh, fairness across clients. Second one says, you want clients to think I'm being treated fairly. Yes, I may not like it, but I was treated fairly. And that's an important thing, especially for residential and also even outpatient. These are people who do not have, who have not been treated fairly in their life. 
people who have trauma, bad life experiences, domestic violence, where they haven't been treated fairly. You have to treat them fairly or you're not going to get anywhere. The second thing that we saw were um, themes around resolving ethical issues. Counselors often said they had to reassess or if necessary, reset counselor and client boundaries. They often exercised judgment when deciding how to be truthful, but also supportive to clients. And they talked a lot about directive resolving of ethical issues versus allowing clients to find their own way around resolving issues. And they discussed a lot about how to empower clients to know their rights, um, such as like teaching clients not to disclose private information in public settings. So some of these themes are reflected in these quotes. The first one says, there is no way I'm going to be able to give you money and that's totally not okay. It's against clinic policy. You just explain this to them that you're not trying to not help them, but you're not, um, you're, you are just not just following clinic rules and that's going to jeopardize your employment. The second quote says, if a client comes to you trying to have a discussion about something that involves them and it's an earshot of others, say, this is really important and I want to hear what you have to say. Can we table it until we get upstairs? This may not be at the appropriate place and time. So like concrete skills around helping people maintain their confidentiality. And then finally, we discussed themes around the training that SUD counselors desired. We heard a lot about direct, um, directive professional development for new counselors, specific guidance on mandated reporting, rapid changes in technology and how some of the training they desired was around how to use things like social media. We heard a lot about role plays for difficult ethical challenges and case consultation, both with supervisors and with peers. And again, having new counselors learn about and anticipate potential ethical issues. So the first quote says, where we can actually discuss and brainstorm and interact with each other and bounce off some ideas, how to best manage them and give specific examples like hardcore cases, challenges. And then we talk about, because each one of us, every one of us has, have a very kind of unique way of dealing and managing those issues. So it's almost like hearing other people's stuff would allow you to anticipate it. The second quote says, they, meaning new counselors, don't have that much training. And so they're doing things that, that they thought was okay, but they don't have any guidance. They're going to continue doing it without realizing that they were running into big potential problems. So to discuss future directions, um, our results emphasize that SUD counselors do in fact face a lot of ethical issues and they recognize the importance and complexity of those uh, ethical dilemmas. They gave us a lot of really good ideas about how to improve ethical dilemma training and um, specifically around what should be included related to instruction and interaction between SUD counselors. And so I just want to um, acknowledge our research team, including our ethics advisory group. Um, and I'd like to end with this slide. I am um, very honored to be one of Jim's trainees and I did a little bit of uh, kind of polling, I guess, some of our other trainees that have worked with Dr. Sorensen. And these are some of the wonderful words that we all use to describe him. So I just wanted to highlight all of the ways that he's impacted all of our careers. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Mark Von Zastro, professor and friend and of LPPI Endowed Chair for Research in Schizophrenia and Depression, UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks so much um, uh, for, the, for the introduction and, and um, I'm really honored to be here to um, uh, uh, see Laurel and a lot of uh, friends and colleagues um, and, and also to, to say a few words about Jim. Um, Laurel and Jim in my mind are the dynamic duo. And, and when I first came to UCSF, I met them both because they were frantically photocopying a grant that was due, I think the next day. Um, and, 
And uh, there was a lot of running around. And uh, so I, I met them both. Um, I, I interacted a, a lot with Laurel um, and less with Jim. But Laurel, every once in a while, would say, you know, I think you should talk with Jim because, you know, we're doing uh, our lab works on very basic sort of mechanics of how opioid drugs and other drugs of abuse work. And you know the question of how this might make sense to the to the world in a bigger sense, and 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 how it might really impact uh, clinical care, was something that I was really struggling with. And Laura would just say, oh, "Maybe you should talk with Jim." So this actually progressed to Jim and I getting together for lunch, and and talking about just things that they were thinking and I was thinking. And um, we realized that the gulf between us was enormous in terms of our day to day. Um, but one of the things that really impressed me about Jim was that he was very practical and very humble about what he didn't know and a, really a deep thinker. And he was broad based. So he was actually very interested in the things that we were doing. And I found in Jim somebody who could really span a big range of of of, of, of interest. And he was also very generous. So he included me in uh, meetings at the, at the general. And I would um, go to uh, some of their clinical research meetings um, uh, uh, with Jim's invitation. So uh, he was actually a big influence on me, although we never formally collaborated. So um, uh, the stuff that I do um, is probably going to look like a bit of a left field, but I'll show it to you anyway, and I'll try to be brief and relatively painless if possible. Um, so uh, uh, again, so thanks, uh, Jim, for, for all of your wonderful um, contributions. And I'm going to focus, and I also want to thank my many terrific lab mates. And, and uh, Jim was a wonderful mentor, and I feel my, I was an informal mentee uh, uh, to Jim um, uh, and to Laurel. Um, and, and, uh, but I want to talk about in, in my lab, I've been blessed with really wonderful people. And I'm really going to just touch on some work from one of my former postdocs, um, uh, just to give you a flavor of it. So this is like going all the way from, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, treatment clinics, uh, uh, at the general to how do these drugs actually work at the molecular level? And so I think uh, many of you already know this, but just to be on the same page, they work through receptors. They work through a really large and important family of receptors called G protein coupled receptors. And they're called that because the central, um, colored thing there is a G protein. And so we know actually these days a lot about these receptors and we know a lot about their pharmacology, the drugs that bind to them. And there's a tremendous um, and interesting diversity of drugs. And actually, if you talk to addicts, they are familiar with differences between the effects of drugs subjectively. So this is sort of a fascinating area of crossover between uh, sort of mechanistic and psychosocial uh, um, research, I think. So in, in my lab, we're interested in how these receptors actually work in neurons where they belong. And that gets us into this whole question about biochemistry being um, coupled with movement of receptors. And for a long time, and if you look in many textbooks, receptors just sit there and do their thing. But the truth of the matter is that receptors are dynamically moving around in cells. And we think that some of these movements are important for function and for things like drug effects. So that's really been the bread and butter of what we do. And we've been delineating over the years, uh, you know, trying to figure out exactly where receptors go and what that movement is about. And in the interest of time, I won't try to belabor this, except that we've been sort of obsessed with this ability of receptors to go from the surface of the neuron to the interior of the neuron and what that significance of that might be. So, and one significance that we recently discovered was not only can receptors signal from the surface, but they can also signal from inside. Um, and and uh, we don't know with opioid receptors what the significance, if there is significance of that, but a former trainee um, who's uh, now in Europe with her own lab has published a paper recently suggesting that there is actually some significance of the internal signal. But I want to just focus on one little vignette. This is 
this is my very bad drawing. You can see why I'm not a, a neuroanatomist. That's my drawing of a neuron. And what, what, I, what I want to point out to you is that opioids have very interesting effects both postsynaptically and presynaptically in the neuron. And postsynaptically, their effects rapidly attenuate or desensitize. Presynaptically, they do not. And this has been a big mystery in basically the, the neuropharmacology of opioids for a long time. And so uh, Damien got interested in this, Damien Julie, um, uh, my former postdoc, got interested in this. And to cut to the chase, what he demonstrated was that in the presynaptic terminal, where the opioid receptors actually mediate signaling to inhibit the normal synaptic vesicle cycle responsible for neurotransmission, in the presynaptic terminal, there's a separate cycle of receptor movement. And the receptor, the opioid receptors actually internalize in the terminal. And then they have a separate trafficking cycle where they go into the cell and then they come back out. And they're constantly doing that when they're activated. And the, the, the thing that that does is it actually enables the terminal to remain sensitive to the opioid um, uh, for a long period of time. And we think that's the crux of why the presynaptic terminal is resistant to desensitization. Um, then we got a, a surprise because uh, Damien had actually identified specific phosphorylation sites in the receptor that were responsible for this internalization. And our colleague, uh, and he'd also identified the kinase that is responsible for phosphorylating the sequence. And then our colleagues, uh, Stefan Schultz's lab in Germany, made a mouse with mutations just in those residues. And what he found was amazing. He found that uh, physiological tolerance, as measured using an antinociception assay, was blunted in these animals. And this was astonishing because this is not something that's happening over a short period of time, seconds to minutes, like the kind of stuff that we were studying. This is happening over days. So this really made us to go back and ask, does the opioid system actually have the ability through the cycling mechanism to become tolerant? And the answer is yes. If you, this is a crazy diagram, um, which only Damien can understand, and maybe I can understand a little bit. But basically, this is how he measured it. But he directly measured neurotransmitter vesicle cycling as an output for the opioid effect. And he showed that with an 18 hour treatment with various opioids, you could get profound tolerance. That's shown in the concentration response curve in the right shift. And this is a summary of those data demonstrating that drugs like morphine can also produce profound tolerance and that this tolerance can actually be blocked by a drug which inhibits this kinase that Damien had, had identified as the key protein responsible for making this whole mechanism work. So what we think is happening is that a certain fraction of these receptors when they go in, don't come back. And so over time you get kind of an accumulative loss of surface receptors and that re results in a cumulative and slow loss of function, which we would call cellular tolerance. And we very recently, and this is really not meant to be understood, um, except to tell you that what we've recently jumped into is to try to do some ex uh, experiments using a biochemical method called quantitative proteomics to try to uh, figure out how this happens. And the cool thing uh, is that there are proteins that we can label specifically right near the receptor uh, when it goes into the cell. And two of those proteins actually have a significant functional effect on the ability of receptors to cycle through and get back out to the cell surface. So uh, I'm gonna close here and say that what we think is going on then is that there's this beautiful dynamic cycle that opioid drugs produce um, at the presynaptic terminal, which we never actually appreciated before Damien's work, um, which enables the terminal to resist desensitization. So it maintains its opioid responsiveness over a period of time of minutes to hours. But over a period of days, it attenuates its response. And the reason we think is because there's this sort of bleed of the internal receptors that can then 
um, we believe uh, get moved out of the away from the terminals and in towards the cell body. And we're still studying that. And the two proteins that we've identified are listed there in the little circle, Retromer and COMD. And these proteins, we're trying to understand actually how they're doing what they're doing, but we think that they're part of the um, explanation for how this process occurs. So getting back to Jim, <laughs> I mean, he was extremely interested in these kinds of problems. And I remember him telling me, uh, one time I came back from a CPDD meeting and I was lamenting to Jim that, my God, I don't think what we're doing is gonna, it has anything to do with this. It, 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 we're so far off track, what are we doing? And he said, keep it up. He said, we need to understand how things work. And in the meantime, we need to fix what we can. And, and I think that really says a lot. And, and I think that was very encouraging to me. And, and, uh, and I really uh, uh, was, was really inspired in, uh, by that. So I, I want to uh, uh, thank Damien, uh, whose work, uh, his hard work is uh, what I talked about. Uh, Damien is now at Merck Pharmaceuticals um, and I'm trying to actually uh, make things uh, better from, from that side. Um, and uh, also, of course, um, uh, thank you, Jim, and happy birthday. Thank you, Dr. Von Zastro. Our next speaker is Dr. Daniel Ciccaroni. Dr. Ciccaroni is a professor at the UCSF Department of Family and Community Medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Hi, everyone, both in the local audience and remotely. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, celebrating Jim's uh, life, his work, his mentorship, his friendship. I want to talk about my work, NIH-funded work, uh, in the opioid overdose crisis, uh, now going on 20-plus years, um, particularly exploring, I'm going to discuss some of the methodology that I've done to explore both its breadth and its depth. Here we have 100 years of mortality data. First spike there is 100 years ago, the so-called Spanish influenza pandemic, followed almost 100 years to the year later by our own recent pandemic that we're still recovering from. It's not the focus of today's talk though. What is, is the, what caused the reversal of fortunes, the rise in um, death rate, the lowering of life expectancy among all Americans due to the overdose crisis, a crisis so big, and the reason why we call it a crisis, so big that could actually uh, change the direction of this curve. This is public health research. Um, and, and, and this shows sort of uh, uh, reflecting other people's comments about the breadth of, of Jim's work, uh, that we can all sit in this room together and go from uh, the biochemical to the uh, uh, to public health. And also reflecting uh, what Dr. Baki brought up, you know, we've changed our language uh, and now we're talking about persons, people who use drugs. Uh, so thanks for bringing that up. So what kinds of research? Well, two big pools of research, quantitative and qualitative. The quantitative involves breath. Um, it's main uh, discipline is epidemiology. There are others. Uh, it's numbers based. And it's gonna help us answer questions of how much, where, and when, what are the trends over time? It gives us a view from 10,000 feet. Now, what I like to do is to couple this with qualitative research, which gives us depth, right? This is in the disciplines of anthropology, sociology. It gives us narrative, it gives us context, it helps answer questions that survey research often can't approach, which is how and why. And by doing that, it gives us plausibility gives us social plausibility. And we need plausibility. Anyone who's studied epidemiology knows that one of the, uh, the key principles that you need to show causality is plausibility. This provides that to the epidemiological side. It helps understand the realities at the street level on the ground. Uh, for the last 10 years, these, these are the two most recent uh, NIH funded studies, the heroin transition study, uh, the HIST study, uh, and also the current one, synthetics and combination, the SYNC study, uh, NIH funded public health research using both of these methods. Um, the core of these two um, is the method methodology, right? So using 
epidemiology and other disciplines. I collaborate with an economist and a mathematical modeler uh, to look at the big picture, right? Particularly how drug supply is changing and how that influences downstream consequences. Uh, but I also have robust, and I, and I love my folks uh, uh, team and uh, ethnographic research. We travel the country looking for hotspots and we're interested because let's, for example, fentanyl is a new drug. We want to know what it is. Do people like it? Uh, do people not like it? How are they adapting to it? How do they even perceive it in their bodies? Um, and, and I'll tell, give you the rhyme and reason as to why we do that uh, in a little bit. So first on the quantitative side, what we want to do is sort of scope out the magnitude of the epidemic. You've seen similar curves uh, from Dr. Volkow this morning, um, showing that this is coming waves, right? I coined the term triple wave epidemic. It's now lingua franca. I'm describing this, uh, the first wave of overdoses due to prescription pills. This segued over to a rise in heroin overdoses as people transitioned from pill use and misuse to uh, heroin use. And then the heroin became contaminated, adulterated with fentanyl and other synthetic opioids leading to the third wave. Uh, we're still in the third wave. Uh, it is quite profound. We have not experienced anything like this, uh, not in certainly anyone's here, here's lifetime. And now we have a fourth wave as has been brought up already, uh, deaths due to stimulants, both methamphetamine and cocaine, often in combination with the synthetic opioids, the fentanyls, uh, causing a rise in overdose deaths. And this is also growing currently. We've done a lot of quantitative papers. This is just a sampling of them. Of them. Um, uh, I've highlighted intertwined epidemics, uh, the triple wave epidemic and the fourth wave, uh, just because those have become lingua franca. These are very well cited papers, at least for public health papers. But one, now I move to the intersection between the two. And because we were doing field work at the time that wave two happened. This is the rise of heroin use and heroin overdose, right? We witnessed this and we studied it both quantitatively and qualitatively. We witnessed the number of rising number of heroin users transitioning from pills to heroin. We looked at this both quantitatively, that's the intertwined epidemics paper. Uh, we also looked at it narratively uh, and that's Sarah Mars's uh, Every Never I Ever Said King True, a very highly cited uh, qualitative paper. Um, the bottom line here for public health and public policy is that we've created, because of the opioid prescription phenomenon, created uh, a historically large um, cohort of heroin users. Uh, current estimates are over 2 million heroin users. It's at least a tripling or quadrupling from prior estimates a decade prior. Um, this has very important um, uh, concerns in terms of how we manage this cohort uh, in terms of prevention and treatment. And if a picture could tell 10,000 words, here it is, uh, the transition from pills to injection. Ethnographic methods, uh, I'll keep brief. Uh, we basically go to hotspots, whether it's overdose hotspots or hotspots of a new drug supply. We just recently came back from Philadelphia because of the xylazine phenomenon. Um, we're interested in understanding the lived experience of the experts themselves and it's people who use the substances. Uh, we actually, we treat them as experts. Um, 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 we're well experienced and, and, and trained in, in doing what we do. Uh, it's very much real world. Uh, if you wanna know more about our work, uh, uh, you can look at my TEDx talk or there's a, a methodology paper cited at the bottom there. Briefly, uh, we have lots of meetings. Here we're meeting outside of a coffee shop in Chicago. Uh, we talk to people uh, in multiple places, both in public spaces, uh, private spaces, cars, uh, in the backs of abandoned factories, for example, that's Philadelphia. Um, if anyone is triggered by drug use, there'll be a couple of minutes of, of one minute of, of drug use slides and I'll let you know when it's over. Um, we're interested in what the drug is, particularly important when it's a new drug. Fentanyl, what does it look like in powder form? What does it look like when it's cooked up? What does it look like in solution? This is not fentanyl, this is heroin. It's a very traditional iced tea colored solution. Uh, um, so famous that songs have been written about it by like Golden Brown by the Stranglers. Um, and there's a fentanyl salt, uh, bright neon yellow. We've seen clear, we've seen cloudy, we've seen white, we've seen blue, we've seen pink, we've seen yellow. Um, it's heated, we're very interested in how people use it, how they inject it, 
Uh, it is an injectable substance. People are increasingly smoking it, particularly in places like San Francisco. Uh, we're interested in the social aspects of it. For example, one person injecting another. Uh, all of these are micro risk factors and help uh, aid in our public health understanding of injection drug use phenomenon. Uh, to summarize a bunch of papers in one slide, um, uh, the changes in heroin supply uh, have been vast. Actually, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave the slide as it is. Um, the bottom one is the most important and that is if people can discern the fentanyl in, for example, in their heroin, then they can take organic precautionary strategies. And we've written about this, um, this in papers. These vicissitudes matter, right? The, the drug is changing a lot. It's changing rapidly. Um, it's changing in color. It's changing in intensity changing in um, duration of effect. And then we went and modeled that. We you know, documented that qualitatively, but then my economist, uh, Dr. Rosenblum at Dalyhus in Canada, um, looked at a drug supply database to show that vicissitudes in potency, vicissitudes in fentanyl analog, which vary a lot by potency, um, could predict next week's overdoses. So we called it an early warning system. Uh, this needs uh, further work. It can lead to behavioral interventions. If people can discern and vicissitudes are important, then people can teach themselves or, uh, or public health interveners can teach them to inject um, smaller shots, more dilute shots. Use a partial shot now and a partial shot in a little bit. Put some up your nose first uh, to see how strong it is and then choose to inject or not. Um, other people have caught on to this. The Be More Power Group in Baltimore has uh, done Go Slow Fentanyl is here. Um, the biggest intervention to come out of this, I think, and this has taken off much faster than anything I've seen in, in harm reduction um, or the preventive aspects of drug use, uh, is drug checking. Here we have um, uh, fentanyl test strips on the upper right and more elaborate uh, spectrometry um, on the lower left. Um, multiple places in the country taking off at this, including San Francisco. Uh, the impact of it, still unknown. Uh, how people interface with it is an open question. But with that, I'll end you all. I'll end with thank you all for your kind attention today. Thank you so much, Dr. Ciccaroni. Our next speaker is Dr. Gideon St. Helen. Dr. St. Helen is an associate professor in the UCSF Department of Medicine. Thank you very much. And I should also note that when Jim retired as the co-director of the lead program, I took his place. Very large shoes to fill. So electronic cigarettes, how they use, and this is switching gears a bit from opioids to electronic cigarettes. How they use and toxicology change across device characteristics. So as you know, millions of young people and adults use electronic cigarettes. In 2023, 2.1 million young people or um, high school students and middle school students use electronic cigarettes. This is actually a significant reduction from 2019, which is what we call the height of the e-cigarette epidemic. In 2019, over 5 million young um, high school students and, and middle school students were current users of electronic cigarettes. In 2021, 4.5% of US adults uh, were current users of electronic cigarettes. So when I think, when we think about the harms and potential benefits of electronic cigarettes. In our lab, which in our research group, um, with Neil Benowitz and Peyton Jacob and myself, we focus on the toxicity as well as the addictiveness of this product. So in, in terms of toxicity, we measure a lot of the toxicants as well as acute effects, acute cardiopulmonary effects um, by various biomarkers. And then we focus on nicotine intake and pharmacokinetics as well as subjective effects. So, yeah, you probably know this already, but in, for most drugs and, and for um, tobacco products, more rapid nicotine delivery is associated with higher addiction potential. So you have more addictive nicotine products. These are the products that produce the higher blood nicotine levels at a shorter time, what they call the C-max, the maximum nicotine concentration at a shorter time to maximum nicotine concentration. And also you have a more rapid reduction in the blood nicotine level after use. So what you see for combustible products like cigarettes, you have a rapid increase in the blood nicotine level. As soon as you stop smoking, you have a rapid reduction in blood nicotine levels. These are the more addictive products compared to, for example, a nicotine gum or oral nicotine products where the, the blood nicotine level takes a longer time to reach the maximum 
and you have very little control over the reduction in time. And in terms of the toxicity, you, um, the greater toxic and exposure is associated with greater toxicity. So we've been conducting studies to understand how the device characteristics, we know that electronic cigarettes are diverse products. We focus on how the device characteristics as well as the user behaviors influence the addictiveness and the toxicity of these products. The first thing we looked at was the flavors and there are multiple flavors for electronic cigarettes. And in these two graphs, I'm showing for a standardized session where we had two study e-liquids, a strawberry flavored and a tobacco flavored, both with the same nicotine concentration. The only thing that's different is the flavor. In the first graph, this is from 15 puffs. And then in the second graph, this is what we call an ad lib session where they vape as much as they want over 90 minutes. And you could see that with the strawberry compared to the, to the tobacco flavor, you have much more, you have higher nicotine intake with the strawberry compared to the tobacco flavor, which tells us that flavors have an intrinsic um, qualities that affect nicotine delivery, nicotine absorption, as well as subjective effects that influence the behavior, um, the vaping behavior of this individual. For example, we looked at um, the vaping topography over the 90 minute ad lib session. They took in the same number of puffs across the flavors, but what they did, they, they vaped um, the strawberry for longer. So the puff duration was longer for the strawberry flavor compared to the tobacco flavor. You will see why this is important in a while. Then we have conducted studies looking at differences across the electrical power or the voltage of the devices. So in older devices, as well as some of the newer models, you are able to change the voltage or the power of these devices. So we are interested in how this affects the use of these products and the toxicology as well as the addictiveness of these products. So in this first slide, this is from a 10 puff standardized session, 10 four second puff standardized session. And you could see that nicotine intake increases as the power of the device increases. In the second set of slides, this is showing for a 90 minute ad lib session. And again, you could see that as the, the power increases, the amount of nicotine that they're taking from these devices also increases. I'm not showing this data here, but the number of puffs that they took during the 90 minute session was almost exactly the same across the power levels. But what changed was the puff duration. Again, you will see why this is important. At the lower power level, they take longer puffs. And as the, puff, as the power level increases, they take shorter puffs. We also monitored, we also had the participants on the research ward over eight to 12 hours. And then we saw the same thing. This is eight to 12 hours of ad lib use. So, and it was eight, eight to 12 hours because before COVID we did 12 hours. So 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then after COVID, because of the changes in the opening hours, we reduced it to 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So you can see similar pattern here with the increase in nicotine intake as the power increases. And again, for this um, session, the, the ad lib session of an entire day, they, again, they took in a similar number of puffs across the power, which I'm not showing it, but what changed is a puff duration. So at the lower power, they took longer puffs as the power increases, the puff duration decreases. And over the, the eight to 12 hour session, we collected urine samples in which we measured different biomarkers. So these are the biomarkers of oxidative stress. And um, the free radicals, for example, that, that could be present in the aerosol or toxicants that could be present in the aerosol could react with, for example, lipids or arachidonic acid to produce what is called lipid peroxidation products. And we measure two of these products, eight isoprostin and this other product. And you could see that at the lower watt, which is different from what we expected, at the lower wattage, you have higher oxidative stress compared to at the higher watt. And why is that? Because of the longer puff duration that they're taking. Remember what I said a while ago, at the lower power, they're taking longer puffs, which means you're able to transmit much more heat energy into the e-liquid from the atomizer, raising the temperature and possibly leading to more um, uh, free radical exposure, which leads to oxidative stress. We measured biomarkers of um, platelet activation, which is an important step in um, blood clot formation, as well as a mark, uh, um, 20 HETE, which is involved in the regulation of blood pressure, blood pressure and similar pattern. Although these were not significantly different, you could see the similar pattern where 
you have greater effects, greater acute cardiovascular effects at a lower power compared to higher power, quite different from what we expected, but it's related to the behavior at the lower power. And then this is an ongoing study where we're looking at the effects across illiquid pH. Um, before, when e-cigarettes just came on the market, they were what the nicotine in there was what is called free base nicotine. And then in about 2015, when Juul, I'm sure you've heard about Juul, Juul marketed what's called um, nicotine salts, where they added a weak acid like benzoic acid to the e-liquid. So we're trying to understand how the pH affects nicotine exposure and subjective effects from e-cigarettes. So nicotine exists as free base nicotine and protonated nicotine. Free base nicotine is more volatile. So than protonated nicotine. And think of it like that. If I have a baseball in this hand and a balloon with the same size, an inflated balloon in this hand. If I try to send the inflated balloon across this room, which is more volatile, it's most likely not going to get to the back. Whereas if I send a baseball, it's probably going to get to the back. So the free base nicotine is much more volatile compared to the protonated nicotine, which affects where they deposited into the lungs. And I will show you this in a while. Um, so we have higher pH is associated with more free base nicotine, and then the lower pH is associated, it, you have more protonated nicotine. So like nicotine salts, um, like the Juul has more protonated nicotine. So this is just showing an illustration of the free base nicotine where you have a more deposition in the upper airways and also in the, um, in the mouth compared to, you have less, uh, deposition in the in the lower lungs where you and it's important because the lower lungs is where you have more rapid absorption of the nicotine compared to the protonated nicotine you have much more deposition in the lower airways compared to in the throat so here we have um, we had two sessions again a standardized session of 15 of 10 puffs four second puff duration and we've seen exactly what we expected with the lower ph you have higher um, CMAX, plasma nicotine CMAX compared to at the higher pH. And then the, the graph on the right shows for the 90 minute ad lib session. Again, they're taking more nicotine with the, the lower pH compared to the higher pH, which is what we expected. We saw the strength of the throat heat was higher with the higher pH. Again, what we expected. The harshness was higher with the higher pH, which is um, again, what we expected. That's, at, that's where you have more free base nicotine. And then the bitterness was also higher with uh, the higher pH. So in conclusion, nicotine delivery and intake vary across device characteristics, such as flavors, power setting, and illiquid pH. These device characteristics um, impact the abuse liability and toxicology of e-cigarettes. And vaping behaviors such as puff duration change across device characteristics, which influence the toxicology of e-cigarettes. And this is... Uh, photo that we took at the NIDA city and siren community meeting just about a week and a half before Jim passed. Um, so this, this photo means a lot to us. We were awarding one of our lead scholars who had just completed the program, her completion certificate. Thank you so much, Dr. St. Helen. Our next speaker, is Dr. Derek Satry. Dr. Satry is a professor in the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, adjunct investigator at Kaiser Permanente, Northern California Division of Research. Please welcome Dr. Satry. So I'm gonna see if I can test the function of this here. There we go. Great, thank you very much. It's, I'm so happy to be able to speak with you today and to honor Jim's memory. Um, I'd like to just start again by thanking Jim and Laurel for over 20 years of mentorship. I came to, to start working at UCSF on the NIDA T32 postdoctoral fellowship in 2001 with Connie Weisner as my research mentor and uh, Jim Sorensen and, um, and Sharon Hall were the leaders of the T32 at that, at that time. And I, um, I, I consulted with Jim over many years on, on many of my grants and projects, especially in more recent years as I began to do more HIV focused research and did more mentoring myself and Laurel helped me with my very first grants and that were paper and pen, you know, paper submitted. She was across the hall from me at Langley Porter for many years. And I think also both of our offices flooded from broken water 
pipes in the ceilings at various times. So we also had that in common. So, uh, so we had a great overview of, of what's happening currently with HIV treatment and prevention and the relationship of substance use disorders from Dr. Volkov this morning. So there's a, a large number of people living with HIV in the United States, as well as infections that continue each year. There's substantial disparities by race, ethnicity, sex, and region of the United States, um, as uh, including areas such as infection risk, uh, comorbidities, and uh, viral control that are impacted by substance use disorders in, in many different ways. We know that uh, substance use disorder treatment can improve HIV outcomes, inclu including many of the behavioral health and the behavioral and motivational intervention approaches that Jim pioneered over the course of his career. So there is much ongoing work on the intersection of HIV and substance use going on across UCSF, as well as at uh, the Kaiser Permanente Northern California Division of Research, which is where most of my work has been based. So for those who, who may not be familiar, KPNC is a large integrated healthcare system serving over four and a half million members in, in Northern California. It includes um, medical, psychiatric, and substance use disorder services, it has a large registry of care for people living with HIV uh, who are receive care across the region and, um, and PrEP services are also an increasing, have been a, an, an important focus uh, in addition to treating people already living with HIV. And we've done work both in uh, treatment of people with HIV and also PrEP as it relates to substance use specifically. So just as a, as, a, as a brief background to the specific study I'm going to talk about, I've been working over the past um, 12 years or so with an outstanding team of people based at UCSF and, and Kaiser looking at uh, data from the HIV registry, substance use screening studies, and intervention work. And over a course of a number of different projects, we found that alcohol use disorder and substance use disorder and psychiatric disorder prevalence is very high using the electronic health record data to examine this around 20 to 30%. It adversely impacts many aspects of HIV care, including retention and care, viral control and mortality. However, we found that relatively few people living with HIV access specialty care services, either psychiatry or substance use. And so this is, again, as, as was mentioned earlier today, has helped um, motivate us to look at integrated care in, pri in primary care to address substance use problems. We've also done a lot of work on computerized substance use disorder screening and mental health, some of which was done at Langley Porter and also at, uh, over at Kaiser Permanente, as well as a series of trials showing that motivational interviewing interventions in primary care can help reduce alcohol and other substance use problems and also can be integrated into mental health services as well. So with that, just as, as a quick overview background, the study that we're just wrapping up is called the Promoting Access to Care Engagement or PACE trial, as NIDA R01 funded study with Mike Silverberg as MPI. It's um, based in Kaiser HIV primary care clinics in Oakland, Sacramento, and San Francisco. It's a hybrid uh, trial design evaluating both implementation and effectiveness outcomes pre-post in each of these three large cl clinics, which collectively serve over 5,000 people living with HIV. We developed a screening model in which electronic questionnaires are completed by patients every six months, either uh, by secure message before they uh, come into the visit or on tablets in the clinic. And then we, tra we trained behavioral health providers in motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy to offer brief interventions in primary care and then to connect uh, patients with specialty care when needed. The measure that we're using is called the tobacco, alcohol, and prescription medication and other substances uh, tool developed and validated by Jennifer McNeely. It's also available on the NIDA website as, as can be self-administered with the results available, can be emailed. So it's, it's something that's being um, 
uh, implemented and, and promoted by NIDA. It has a branching structure and assesses substance use disorder risk across the range of substances that you see here. So this was the substance use tool that we used. And then we also assessed depression and anxiety using um, the PHQ-9 and the GAD-2 in an instrument that was packaged together and called the Adult Outcomes Questionnaire at, um, in, uh, for the study. So we did a lot of preliminary work with health IT staff and clinic leaders to develop a system to routinely screen patients and then integrate the results of these measures into the electronic health record. And this shows an example of a dashboard that was developed that shows color-coded risk scores for the range of substances that patients could uh, report using, either low risk, uh, moderate or higher risk. It included uh, color-coded risk for anxiety and depression, as well as an indicator of suicidal ideation that was flagged so that um, providers would see that since this is a, is a concern with computerized screening, are people gonna see this if patients are reporting suicidal ideation? So this was very well received. Patients appreciated it. And we've had a, a, a lot of qualitative um, interviews and papers published that I'm not gonna get into that really um, highlighted the acceptability and feasibility of this to integrate this screening as well as our intervention model into the HIV clinics. So just briefly, this shows the range of, of substances that were report, reported by patients over two years that the screening was in the field. We had um, over 3,800 individual screenings completed by over 2,800 unique patients. Um, and just a high level key outcomes, we had strong implementation of, of the screening and treatment protocol. Um, as I said, completed by a large number of patients, a 62% implementation rate. We also found that before and after the implementation of this, of this model, that there was increased screening by providers using, using their regular um, screening measures. So greater rate of assessment of diagnosis or, and assessment of, um, of risk for substance use and psychiatric disorders using their, their usual tools. So interview-based um, diagnoses, et cetera. The effectiveness outcomes have been mixed. We, we haven't seen changes in our SUD and mental health risk scores um, by, this, by these measures, pre and post intervention. However, we have seen among those screening positive for elevated risk, we've seen significant decreases over time in a range of substance use as well as um, mental health symptoms. We have a renewal application and development to examine sustained implementation over time. And um, I also just wanna mention that we have lots of additional analyses and process, and process working with NIDA T32 fellows. We're also working with visiting professors from the UCSF Center for AIDS Prevention Studies, looking at um, racial and ethnic disparities, predictors of cannabis problems, suicidal ideation, and other, um, other secondary analyses that are coming out of these large data sets, which are also integrated into um, our electronic health records. So we've got screening plus the, the integrated electronic health record. So uh, we're, the team is supported by, we have an outstanding network of investigators at uh, Kaiser Permanente Division of Research at UCSF. So, um, as well as the CAPS VP folks, so who have partnered with us. So, um, probably leaving off a few people there as well. But I also I want to just at the very end give a, a, a shout out to the NIDA T32 postdoctoral training program that Jim led for many many years. And this this slide shows our current faculty and trainees who um, who contributed who are who all have are either doing. NIH funded research and or clinical services across all UCSF sites. And it's just an outstanding uh, team that is continuing to build on Jim's legacy. Thank you. I am happy to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Marina Tulishams. Dr. Tulishams is the Kilroy Realty Endowed Professor and Vice Chair for Community Engagement, Outreach and Advocacy at the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. 
Please welcome Dr. Tula Shams. Thank you, Dr. Masan. Um, such a pleasure uh, and honor to be here to honor Jim. Um, I'm gonna to talk today about Tequity and youth substance use prevention. No disclosures or conflicts of interest to report. I'm gonna start right away with acknowledgements. None of these slides would be coming your way without everyone on this slide, this whole community, the funders, National Institute on Drug Abuse, National Institute of Mental Health, Foundation, donors, our Juvenile Injustice Behavioral Health Team based at San Francisco General, and our city, county, community partners, and the children, youth, and families who participate in our work. And a special thank you to Dr. Jim Sorensen for his invaluable support, encouragement, and mentorship. So since we're all telling a dynamic duo story, 1996 to 1998, I worked at the VA in Building 8 in George Fine's Neuropsych and Substance Use Lab. Laurel was our amazing grants administrator. I was the one also doing copying at the last minute and running to the FedEx station. And from afar, I knew about Jim Sorensen's work at San Francisco General and have been eyeing it ever since in graduate school. So it's been my honor when I, when I was offered the position in 2015 to come to UCSF to be at San Francisco General with Jim Sorensen, such, such a tremendous, tremendous honor. And ever since he has been an incredible mentor and colleague to me. So our mission at the Juvenile and Justice Behavioral Health Lab is to leverage technology for good to expand behavioral health care access for systems impacted youth. And we study ways to do that. Just some key definitions, systems impacted youth, we're talking about adolescents and young adults through age 26 who've had some type of contact with the juvenile legal and or child welfare system. And when we're talking about this term tequity, which is a relatively new term, we use RE and colleagues definition, which is the strategic development and deployment of technology to promote health equity. And our research brings social justice and anti-racism to Tequity. We're health equity and health services researchers, but we bring these lenses related to the populations and the communities with whom we work. And Clark et al has five pillars that really actually, for those of you who know about community-based participatory research, participatory engaged research, um, participatory co-design research. These are similar pillars where we invest in our people and our communities. We are trustworthy and we collect data that are relevant to diverse communities and we keep those data secure. We use analytics, and I'll talk a little bit about AI later. We're not doing AI work yet, um, to promote health equity. And the purchases of tech must also drive the change. And so we engage in participatory co-design for our work where from the ground up, we are co-designing the interventions for the users with them. We develop innovative partnerships that engage diverse communities, many of those whom you saw on the acknowledgement slides. But I do just want to say that in this work, it's nascent work and technology is not a panacea. And we have to conduct research with that framework, that thinking in mind, we need to question assumptions that technology advances actually consistently benefit human health. And when we're doing this research and a lot more research needs to be done in this area, we need to consider potential gains and the harms. And so some of the major leaders in, in this area, Ruha Benjamin has written multiple books, but one is Race After Technology, uh, has done a lot of research in looking at how technology survey, using um, for surveillance in the criminal justice system, for example, the potential harms and ills associated with using technology for that purpose. Sasha Costanza Chalk has a beautiful book uh, looking at community participatory uh, action research and those principles and overlaying it with technology design for interventions with communities. And then our colleague, um, Adriana Aguilera, wrote a beautiful op-ed in the New York Times recently with really talking about the importance of thinking about how we conduct digital health equity research. So this slide um, is similar to that that Dr. Volkow uh, presented this morning, why is it important to look at equity and health equity and this concept of tech equity, if we're looking at technological interventions to improve access to care, these are San Francisco data from our juvenile detention facility. 
For every one white youth, 38 black youth are detained. That's why we do this work because we are working to change access to care. We're working to also change the systems, which I'll talk about. We're working at different levels with technology to make shifts in the systems overall and access to substance use services along with substance use and mental health services, so for co-occurring. And we do that because 70% of adolescents entering juvenile detention centers have a diagnosable mental health need. And actually first time, our data show that first time court involved adolescents who are diverted from detention and supervised in the community also have significant mental health and substance use related treatment needs. So one in three have a history of psychiatric diagnosis that's at 14 and a half years old. One in five have a history of inpatient hospitalization and one in two have current psychiatric symptoms severe enough to require treatment. 50% of these youth were reporting more than daily use of cannabis use as well when they were reporting these data. So care is needed, but we know access is highly limited. And I just wanna bring your attention to that 50% of youth in community supervision require substance use treatment and 16% or fewer of those youth receive treatment for any psychiatric disorder. And these data are from after release from detention, but the same is true in the community, there is limited access to care. So our approach, we take um, these four areas of community engaged research, health equity principles, participatory co-design and social justice. And we overlay them onto eco-developmental theories. We work with young people and we have multiple different interventions in which we're trying to improve access to substance use services for young people who are system involved at individual family, extra familial and structural levels. So this is a listing of our active projects, several of which are NIDA funded and one NIMH funded. And I'm not gonna be able to go into detail of all of these, um, but I'm showing you the breadth and the different levels of the work that we're engaged in. And much of this is pilot work. And again, I wanna emphasize it's nascent. This is a ripe area for research who those are interested in health equity research and health services research. And at, you know, Jim's voice is like in my ear saying, go for it, go for it, right? Because it's, um, there are not a lot of data to necessarily support this work initially, but that's what we're working on. We're building that. And so Foster Space, I'll just talk for a second about is our co-designed app with young people with living experience in the foster care system. We spent 18 months together once a week and we developed an app from scratch that provides resources, mental health and substance use related, a navigator that's within the app, direct clinical services for those who meet, need substance use and or mental health, and we have a foster space advisory board that are our co-designers and they provide online supports, peer supports for foster youth ages 13 to 26 in the state of California um, who can access the app. We are pending NIDA funding right now for an implementation science trial to really understand how the foster space app can be used and integrated within existing systems who are serving foster youth. So court appointed special advocates work one-to-one, -one, they're volunteers to support foster youth. And we're going to try to understand what facilitates uptake and utilization of the foster space app to increase access to care for these young people through CASA workers. And then we're going to see for those youth who use it, to what extent they reduce their substance use. Um, we have a foster care family mental health navigator grant that is in the final stages of uh, its efficacy trial, small pilot efficacy trial, where uh, we partnered with our systems. So a foster care mental health clinic, they co-designed a six session intervention in which they provide psychoeducation and information to families about how to navigate the complex specialty mental health and substance use treatment centers in the community. And we're looking to see whether we increase linkage from referral for court, from the court for mental health evaluation and or substance use evaluation to the community. And then we have another text messaging intervention for youth and caregivers to see if these youth who are referred to substance use treatment while on probation 
are actually more likely to attend their substance use treatment services if they receive motivational text messages, the youth and the caregiver. So there are multiple challenges and opportunities. I will just say that we have to be thinking about how to expand access and care to achieving equity for youth um, substance use services. And this is highly complex. So um, we need to expand and think about how we can expand, how we bring things to scale, very complex. Um, when you're trying to build these trusting relationships and using participatory co-design tools with historically excluded groups. Um, we need to obtain data on users, um, non-users of this technology to inform how we reach them. You can build the apps, but will they use it? And we're coping with public systems with competing priorities and mandates. So we need to be balancing all of this as we're thinking about conducting this research rigorously. And in Jim's honor, in always being forward thinking, I'm just gonna leave this here, future directions, whole open area of AI and digital machine learning research with substance use in these systems that are serving these youth to think about expanding care. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tulashams. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Philip Coffin. Dr. Coffin is the Director for Substance Use Research at the San Francisco Department of Public Health Center for Public Health Research. Please welcome Dr. Coffin. Good afternoon. So Jim, for me, was, uh, I love that word cloud, it was perfect. So warm and welcoming and, you know, welcome brought me into NIDA CTN and, uh, and, and lead and everything else. And it's been, uh, it was such a honor and a pleasure knowing him. In the spirit of my, one of my first interactions with Jim, which was to try to convince him that handing out naloxone was a good idea. I was successful, um, no surprise. Not with Jim. Uh, I'm going to take my few minutes to try to convince you, um, without burying the lead, that stimulant toxicity is not overdose. So um, we all know stimulant deaths are rising a lot. So you've got uh, on the left is is cocaine, on the right is methamphetamine. But really importantly, what you see, are especially with cocaine, is that almost all this increase is is opioids. So this is all fentanyl, right? And with fentanyl, with, sorry, with methamphetamine, you saw an increase of methamphetamine without opioids until about 2019. And then since then, that really stable, stabilized. And the increase since then, which has been even more profound, is methamphetamine fentanyl deaths. So we've got these kind of two categories of stimulant deaths, the stimulant opioid deaths and the stimulant deaths by themselves. The stimulant opioid deaths, I would argue, are way more similar to opioid deaths. These are mostly probably opioid deaths. First off, it's really important to note, there is no upper downer toxidrome. Nobody has ever come into an emergency room, not breathing, blue, and freaking out. Um, and in fact, most of, most of the studies out there going back, you know, back to the 50s when we had, um, when, when we gave uh, cocaine and morphine and alcohol to people with end of life pain. We've known for a long time that stimulants in fact raise the respiratory threshold for opioids. So if you had to do a line of fentanyl and a line, and, and I said you could do it with methamphetamine or not, you should use the methamphetamine too, because it's gonna raise the threshold to respiratory depression for you in that moment. Of course, in reality, when you're out there, when the behavioral effects of using these two drugs together puts you at higher risk for overdose, but the actual pharmacologic effect is protective. So, and then when we, when we look at opioid and stimulant deaths in terms of their comorbidities, that chart on the right, it's a little bit complicated, but in the, the light green is acute stimulant, no opioid deaths. And those uh, have a lot of additional co contributing causes of death about six, about almost two thirds of an additional contributing cause of death and over 40%, 45% of a cardiac, cardiovascular cause of death. And there's a fair number with cerebral vascular accident, brain bleeds or strokes as, as an additional cause of death in these acute deaths. Whereas for opioids uh, or, and for opioids, 
it's exactly the same basically as opioids and stimulants, which is way less of these additional causes of death, way less of these additional comorbidities. They look, they smell like opioid deaths, these opioid stimulant deaths. So my argument here is first off, the, these opioid stimulant deaths, we really frankly shouldn't be calling stimulant deaths. I, I do all my work on stimulants. I need the money. I need those numbers to be high so I can get the money. But the reality is these opioid stimulant deaths are, they're fundamentally right now, at least driven by fentanyl. So the stimulant opioid, stimulant without opioid deaths, they're really, really different on even more profound levels. So first off, they're a lot older. In San Francisco, they're 55 on average for the acute deaths and 45 for the acute opioid deaths and 47 to 48 for the, for the opioid stimulant deaths. So, you know, there might be a few in there that are more stimulant, but the vast majority of these deaths are fundamentally opioid deaths. The other thing about them is there's a lot more non-acute deaths. So if you look at opioids without stimulants, 85% are determined to be, sorry, opioids, uh, that first line should be, yeah, opioids without stimulants, 85% are determined to be acute. This is a new way we're looking at data in San Francisco where we're looking at all drug related deaths, not just these sort of acute overdose deaths. And um, when we, so, we were, so we we're able to look on, on the left part of that chart, you can see the percent that are acute. And on the right is the percent that are considered non-acute, but related. And for opioids without stimulants, it's 85% was for opioids and stimulants combined with stimulants, 98% are considered acute. For stimulants without opioids, only 70% are considered acute. And I would argue that that's a way overestimate because most of these deaths are cardiovascular in nature. And frankly, result in chronic cardiovascular disease. And uh, for alcohol, it's 6%. So ultimately, when I look at these data and when we're looking at cases, because we, we're doing some deep dives into mortality now, what we see is that stimulant deaths look a lot more like alcohol deaths. They're, disease, they're deaths from chronic organ disease and they, sh frankly, we should be thinking about them more like alcohol deaths and trying to come up with our solutions to manage that mortality more like we do for alcohol. I'm gonna give you one example from our psychological autopsy study of stimulant deaths. So first off, before I tell you the example, um, we reached out to families for, uh, and, and, and friends to get information about these deaths. And first we started with stimulant fentanyl deaths and we said, we're we're contacting you to talk about accidental deaths. You knew so-and-so, and it went great. Then we started reaching out to the stimulant no opioid deaths, families. And we said, we're reaching out to talk about accidental death. And they got pissed. They got so angry because what they heard was that we were calling it an overdose and it wasn't an overdose. It was a heart problem. And so they did not see it as an overdose. And that's when I started to realize that we're the only, us bean counters are the only ones calling these overdoses. The people living them are not because that's not what they are with the rare exception. And we switched to premature death and it went great. And we had no more problems with family reactions. This is an example. So this was a gentleman who uh, came from middle America with, uh, he was bisexual, estranged from his family, like many sexual gender minorities came to San Francisco and his found family was his family. It was fundamentally, every, every it, it was everything to him. And they, and it was in a community that used a lot of methamphetamine. And a lot of friends aged out of use or they died. And he developed congestive heart failure and COPD to such a point that he couldn't make it to the end of the hall to visit his friend because he was too sick. And then he was found deceased in his room after not being seen for a few days. And there was methamphetamine in his blood and it's called acute methamphetamine poisoning. And this to me sounds a lot more like, um, let's say an aging parent who doesn't have family, an aging, an elder who doesn't have family anymore and their friends have started to pass and they're being left, they're kind of left to their own devices and, and they have a lot of comorbidities and they pass. So, What's the solution to this? So first off, forcing stimulant deaths into the same box as opioid overdose deaths is a mistake. And it's a mistake I feel partially responsible for. I've been at this overdose thing for a lot of years. Um, but fundamentally, you know, a reversal agent is really unlikely to have an impact. 
there are efforts out there in the United States to develop agents that reverse methamphetamine and fentanyl at the same time. Try to come up with an actual use for that. Um, so what are the interventions? So use reduction is really key. And in our pharmacotherapy trials, we don't, and actually even in our contingency management trials, we don't measure use reduction, we measure abstinence. We're looking at a qualitative urine and that's a big problem we need to fix quickly. Second is really thinking about this from a chronic disease model perspective. Thinking about social isolation, that is huge, which brings up this concept of an elder care model for managing this. A lot, our deaths and even our opioid deaths in San Francisco are old compared to the rest of the country. And a lot of these people have a lot of comorbidities. They're, they're really sick. And we might not be able to save lives forever when people have experienced a lot of premature aging from their, related to their substance use, their housing status, and other things. And I think we're approaching this wrong. That's all I have to say. I hope I convinced a few people. Um, and thank you to Jim. Uh, happy birthday. It was... Um, a pleasure. It's been a pleasure and an honor to have you in my life. Thank you so much, Dr. Coffin. Our next presenter is Dr. Dennis McCarty. He's Professor Emeritus at Oregon Health and Science University School of Medicine and School of Public Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McCarty. Thank you, Dr. Masson. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this celebration of Jim's birthday and tribute to his work. A lot has been said today. I'm going to add a bit of perspective uh, as a colleague, as someone who competed with Jim for grants and as a collaborator. I admired Jim and I'm pleased that our careers were intertwined for three decades. We worked on similar issues. We looked at the organization and financing of healthcare to see what its effects were on treatment, treatment outcomes, treatment quality for alcohol and drug use disorders. We looked at implementation and the transition from practice to research. We served on a number of key committees together. And over that time, I think that these four characteristics uh, characterize Jim, these attributes characterize Jim in some important ways. I'll talk more about each of those, but I think I need to add some context about our relationship and the things we did together over those three decades. We met in 1995, it was a small invitation only meeting. It was hosted by Barry, Barry Brown, a NIDA project officer and Tom McClellan, editor of Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment. It was focused on addressing the HIV problems among people who injected drugs. Most of the meeting participants were working together on harm reduction initiatives, outreach efforts. Jim and I were in a different category. He was working with treatment programs. I was working with policy issues. We didn't quite fit in, but the advantage was we ended up at dinner with Barry Brown and Tom McClellan. It was a quiet dinner, and it was the first of many dinners in which we were able to collaborate and sometimes conspire. Later that year, we were both invited to participate as founding members of the study of NIDA's new study section for health services research. It was called NIDA F. It was setting standards for how NIDA was evaluating uh, pr proposals for health services research and how they were making their funding decisions. Jim was the co chair or the chair for the first 10 years of that committee and had profound effects on it. Whoops, whoops, slides are in a different order, excuse me. 
Uh, our third collaboration was that with Connie Wisner and Paul Roman, we were invited to summarize the maturation of health services research within the NIDA portfolio when NIDA had a 40th anniversary symposium reviewing their research initiatives. We were also both members of the Bridging the Gap Committee. This is the committee that looked at the distance between practice and research and community-based treatment. NIDA and NIAAA were making investments in developing new technology, new techniques that were more effective, and yet those services were not being imported, were not being used in community-based drug abuse treatment programs. The very first recommendation that committee made was to develop a research infrastructure that included community-based treatment programs to test these interventions in the chaos of the real world. That became the foundation for NIDA's investment in the clinical trials network. Within the clinical trials network, we both led nodes. Those were the units that were participating in the clinical trials network. Jim was the head of the California, Arizona node. I was leading the Oregon node. NIDA made a decision that they were gonna reduce the size of the clinical trials network from 13 nodes to nine nodes. Jim and I looked at the math. We looked at the competition. We figured that we were better together than apart. We became collaborators rather than competitors. And that was a key moment and we were able to survive that transition. Based on these experiences, these five sets of experiences, that's where I draw this list of, okay, I'll do it this way. Uh, that's where I draw in these characteristics. Um, first, Jim was, I know what I did. Uh, first, anyway, Jim was uh, led and participated effectively in all of these settings because of his commitments to inclusion. He was the first to invite people to the table. He hosted dinners at professional meetings and made sure that the new people in the meeting were invited to the dinner. He led poster sessions at the American Psychological Association annual meeting. And he made sure that he talked to each and every one of those new investigators who was presenting, welcomed them to the field and said good things about their research. And he also took care of his older colleagues. He encouraged me to apply for fellowship status within the American Psychological Association. I wouldn't have done that spontaneously. I'm not that kind of person. Jim adopted me. He helped me succeed. He promoted me. He promoted many people. You didn't have to be a young person to get promoted. Jim's kindness was a key feature of his skill set. As the chair of the NIDA F committee, the study section, we were developing a field. This field really didn't exist before NIDA F began to evaluate the applications. We were setting standards for what those research applications should look like. And Jim insisted that we be gentle with our critiques, that we encouraged, we make useful suggestions on how these non-competitive applications could be strengthened and become competitive. Jim was also the first chair of the CTN executive committee. We had a room of 13 principal investigators, 13 people leading chief executive officers of community treatment organizations. These were strong personalities. Jim used gentle reminders to stay on topic, quiet observations of the need to wrap up He managed meetings, diffused tensions, and generated consistent and credible perspectives on NIDA's priorities. When I followed Jim as chair of NIDA-F and of the CTN, 
I would ask myself, WWJD, what would Jim do? Jim also, a key feature was embracing diversity. He wasn't scared of diversity, he valued diversity. His learning for early careers in education and diversity program was built on the foundation of the Clinical Trials Network and gave many, under, many people from underrepresented groups the opportunity to earn their first uh, awards from the National Institutes on Health. And a key characteristic, one that I appreciated and admired was his ability at the end of a meeting or at the end of a day to say, these are the presentations we listened to. These are the decisions we made. These are the action steps that remain. He set the stage for the next day or the next year. And he did that with humility and excellence. There's another feature that probably, that hasn't been mentioned today. That was his collection, his carefully curated collection of tidy tie tacks selected from the Bay Area's best garage sales. <laughs> because of these qualities, Jim succeeded in his career at UCSF. He spurred HIV and drug use research. He promoted addiction health services research, helped to implement implementation research, mentored early career and mid-career investigators. And I'm grateful that we had three decades of collaboration. I valued our friendship. I missed his support. Thank you, Jim, for saving a seat at the table for me and for many others. Um, thank you for your contributions to research addressing substance use disorders and the comorbidities that communicate, and, that complicate and challenge treatment and recovery. Laurel, thank you for sharing Jim with us and for his constellation of tasty, tidy, tiny and tacky tie tacks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McCarty. Our last speaker is Dr. Joseph Geidish. Dr. Geidish is Professor Emeritus at the UCSF Department of Medicine and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. Please welcome Dr. Geidish. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Jim, Jim would say, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't do this, he would say, it's my job to get us out of here on time. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we're past time. Uh, I can't do anything about that. Two quick anecdotes I would like to tell about Jim, and, and then I want to say something about his training here in our department. One is that when I was a young postdoctoral fellow here in this department, Jim was my mentor for many years. You know, as your postdoc scholar, and then your junior faculty, and he was my mentor through all those years, became my colleague, later a friend. Uh, when I was a young postdoc, I always had this image of him, and I'm going to try to explain to you, and I use a football analogy. I had an image of him out in front blocking for me. And what I, what I meant by that was removing obstacles, using his goodwill, using his knowledge of, of, of the system and of others to create a pathway for me to succeed. Um, sometimes I knew that he was doing that because he would tell me or I could see him. But I had this feeling that even when I couldn't see him, he was out there, he was downfield somewhere, still blocking for me, creating a pathway, covering my mistakes, you know, talking with reviewers or chairs or other faculty who maybe I made a mistake or I annoyed or whatever, and Jim was out there using his goodwill to, to make it okay so that that didn't stick with me so that I could have a second chance or a third chance. The second anecdote I wanna tell is that one time, only one time, after I had known Jim for a number of years and I was talking with him and I was complaining. I was complaining about a faculty that we both knew we had in common. And, uh, uh, and, and he, he, he looked at me and he, he did this where he bit his tongue, you know, he did like that. And he said, Joe, I'm biting my tongue. And that was all he said. And I, I, I understood in that moment that he meant, I, I know what you're talking about, but I'm not gonna go there. 
And I, I, I can say in 30 years of my work with Jim, I never heard him say a bad word about anyone. And so th these two anecdotes for me kind of capture um, my thumbnail sketch about Jim is that he was profoundly generous as you've heard from different people uh, in the way he treated us, all of us, including his trainees. And he was keenly reserved in his approach to criticism. Um, now, you heard about a lot of things about Jim. You heard about his roles in many, many areas, and particularly training, not only training, but teaching, training, mentorship. He was my mentor, Caravella's mentor, Carmen's mentor, Derek's mentor, 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 for so many of us. Um, I, and I wanna just, I know him best in the context of our department, of things that happened in our department, in our house, right here where we are now. And those are three particular training programs. One is the clinical psychology training program, which I was in in 1986. And Jim was teaching in that program 35 years ago. And I know um, at the time that we lost him that he was still working with recent scholars in that program on, on a paper now, public, now accepted. Um, so he was engaged with that program 35 years. He also, you heard about, you may not know it, but you heard about the Barnida T32 program in health services research. And he worked in that program for many years. He was a leader in that program for about 10 years. I was a co-leader with him. He invited me to co-lead with him. And he also, you, you also heard from Dennis about our R25 lead program, which Jim started together with Carmen, Michael Shopshire. That was in about 2014. Now, that, that program, by the way, is, is an interesting program because it's, it's, the goal is to recruit racially minoritized investigators, to bring them into a mentorship training um, network, and to support them in successful competition for NIH grants. And the reason this is important, I think what's important to Jim, is that it's, it's a way, it's a pathway forward. It doesn't accomplish everything, but it's a way to address the in inequalities that we see and that we've learned about in NIH funding for these scholars and these populations. These programs have been here for 35 years, the first one, 30 years, the second one, 10 years for the third one now going into 15 years. One of the problems we always had with these programs, anybody who's led a program, you won't think about it unless until you've had a chance to lead a program. But when you lead a training program, you'll learn that there's some things the program can't pay for. You know, we, me and Jim, we wanted to support uh, the networking and the, and the professional development of our, of, our, of, our, of our scholars. We wanted to be able to take new scholars out to lunch when they came. We wanted to be able to have a dinner with them at the end of a, of, of a four or five week summer intensive. We wanted, to, we wanted to have a visiting scholar. And when that visiting scientist, you know, a national scientist would come and talk to them, we wanted to be able to get them around a table with that scientist at the end of the day for dinner so that they could informally, you know, get to know what it's like, see what it's like, build relationships, networks that will serve them all into the future. That's what we wanted to do. We couldn't do that. You can't do that with NIH funding typically. And maybe some people can do it. We could never do it. We never had a solution. So in the spirit of, you know, Jim's looking forward uh, and trying to find solutions, a few of us talked about this when we lost Jim and we developed uh, James Sorensen training endowment in our department. This endowment will spin off a few thousand dollars every year. And if those programs are here for 10 or 20 or 30 more years, the directors will have a small amount of money to support uh, learners in this professional development networking activities. The information about that, if you are inclined to contribute is on the back of your um, program. I just have to say some thank yous. I thank the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. They provided the fiscal and a lot of logistical support to make this happen. There was a seminar planning group. I thank the planning group. They worked for a couple of months also to make this happen. I thank our speakers who came, some who came a long way and all of who, whom gave generously of their time to be here. And I thank all of you for coming and I invite you to join us in the reception on the fourth floor. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us today. It's just been wonderful to you know, uh, hold Dr. Uh, Sorensen's memory and uh, celebrate his birthday. 
I, you know, we lost him too soon and I wish he could be with us. Um, I do want to say that um, the reception will be held, I think, on the fifth floor um, this afternoon. I think due to rain and, and it being cold, uh, we are bringing the reception indoors. Isn't that right, Nicholas? Yes. So the fifth floor. So please welcome and uh, join us.